Fire Breathing Blaze, Dragons of the Bayou, Book Three, written by Candace Ayers, narrated by Tina Scott. Chapter One, China. The band played Zydeco music, a bluesy R&B combined with a unique Louisiana Bayou twang all its own. I half listened to them warm up while sipping my margarita, strains of accordion, fiddle, and washboard, or fortoir as the Cajuns called it. A margarita had been a bad choice. Who'd have thought that a mixed drink from a hole in the wall with sawdust on the floor wouldn't be delicious? What had I been thinking? My twin sister was in pregnancy bliss, while my closest work colleague was soon to tie the knot and my knee-jerk reaction was to run out to the closest honky-tonk with a half-baked plan of throwing myself at the first literate and relatively well-groomed man that caught my eye. Stupid. So stupid. Although I was willing to admit that perhaps it only seemed stupid because I'd been sitting at Barney's Fay Do Do for over an hour, and still the only man under the age of 60 was the bartender, who I knew from high school. If some hunk had walked in and caught my eye, it might have been an amazing plan. If I was being completely honest, I wasn't exactly here because of anyone else. Not Cherry, who was having a baby and had found an amazing man to spend her life with. And not Karis Hubert, chair of the science department, who had posted a picture of her engagement ring-clad left hand on Facebook and received over 500 likes. I was here because of everyone else. Every single person in my life was moving on with theirs. Marriage, babies, white picket fences, and minivans. Everyone was growing up, and I was still a workaholic, spending my free nights at home grading papers, planning PowerPoint slides for lectures, conducting research, or writing papers about my research. Sure, I'd had lots of dates, but no one special, ever. That had been fine. I liked my life working a semester a year as part-time adjunct professor at Lafouche Community College and taking freelance horticulture gigs. Most importantly, I was free and unencumbered, under no one's thumb. I could go where I wanted and do what I wanted, provided I wasn't contracted to teach that semester. I could leave the country on a whim and often did. That was how I knew the margarita I was drinking was crap. The last margarita I'd had was in this tiny place on the coast of Mexico. It was said that the place was once owned by the man who invented margaritas, Carlos Herrera himself. At 29 years old, I'd already lived a full life of travel and exploring. Yet, I was alone. I had Cherry, but she was starting her own family. There was no one else tying me down, nothing tethering me to anything, which was awesome. Except, I felt as though my life had become stagnant. I'd been in a melancholic funk about it. Somehow, I'd figured the best place to start moving on with my life and expanding my horizons was to lose my virginity and gain a little sexual prowess. Yes, there were plenty of men friends in my life who would have undoubtedly jumped at the chance to pluck the bloom from my rose, so to speak. But going that route had the potential for complications. Men could get clingy, and I wasn't looking for complications. Just a one and done, a hit it and quit it. My plan was strictly in the interest of research. The idea of reaching the age of 30 and never having had sex seemed strange. Plus, what if I'd happened to meet the man of my dreams and I had no idea what to do in the bedroom? I wouldn't want to embarrass myself. What if I sucked? Well, I suppose sucking would be a good thing, but I didn't want to be a lousy lay. Or maybe I was just jealous of all the hot nights and days my twin sister seemed to be having lately. I wasn't exactly sure why I thought it was what I needed to do, rushing out to a hole-in-the-wall bar to find an anonymous stranger to have sex with. It was remotely possible my brain was impaired from the vast quantities of sugar I'd been ingesting lately. Chocolate in every form. Cake, cookies, all the candy I had ever wanted to try as a child. I was stuffing my face with whatever form of sweets I could get. I didn't do melancholy well. 
I tended to try and smother it with sugar. I sat back in my chair and looked around again. While there were a few men looking my way, they were mostly silver-haired and pot-bellied. I didn't mind older and more mature, but I drew the line at Grandpa. Johnny, the bartender, was okay enough, but I couldn't imagine having sex with him. That was my problem in a nutshell, though. I'd been close enough to sex a few times, but I never could see it through. I wasn't shy about my body. I wasn't embarrassed by the act itself. I just couldn't get into it. I'd even wondered if I was gay, but I had even less attraction to women, so I had to rule out lesbianism. The men never seemed right, no matter how much I wanted them to be. Maybe I was just broken. Oh hell, of course I was broken. So? Weren't most people to some extent or another? I pushed the margarita around on the table a bit, sliding the glass in its own sweat. I needed to just admit defeat and leave. There was always tomorrow. I could down the drink, go home, pour myself a glass of sweet tea, and eat a box of brownies. Those little fake kinds that come in the plastic wrapper and had cosmic candies on top. My stomach growled at the idea, and I nodded to myself. Cosmic brownies it was. I stood up and walked over to Johnny at the bar. While he finished up with someone else, I focused on digging through my purse to try to locate my credit card. I finally found it, sandwiched between a couple of baggies of plant samples, and pulled it out with a flourish. My arm smashed into something hard, and I looked back to find an incredibly tall, incredibly handsome man wiping beer from his face. My eyes widened and my mouth fell open, but my hands went to work. I grabbed the empty glass of beer from him and set it on the bar before snatching a handful of bar napkins to begin mopping him up. I am so sorry. I glanced up at his handsome face and frowned. I wasn't paying any attention. I'll get this dry cleaned for you if you want. His stony face cracked into a smile and he shrugged. It's just a t-shirt. Well then, at least let me buy you another beer? I motioned to Johnny, who immediately grabbed a glass and started pouring something from the tap. Again, I'm so sorry. Apology accepted, but not necessary. Nothing to worry about. I won't melt. Well, he was hot enough to melt butter. If there were a few more women in the bar, they'd all be melting over this guy. Even I had almost softened. No melting for me, though. Not the broken woman. He was a stunner, but I still found myself looking toward the exit, thinking about ultra-processed packaged brownies. To hell with my plan tonight. I just wanted to go home. Johnny handed the man his beer and took my card from me, leaving me alone with the drenched stranger again. Thank you for the beer. He started to walk away and then looked back at me. Would you care to join me? I glanced toward the door once more and, out of the corner of my eye, spotted Johnny on his way back over with my card. I was aware that I was facing what could be a pivotal moment in my life. I was standing at a crossroads and, depending on the direction I took, the next few hours could be a turning point. I wanted to go home, but I was trying for something different. Growth. I looked down at my feet and then back up at the stranger and shrugged. Sure. He motioned to the bar. Would you care for another drink? I nodded at Johnny that I'd take another margarita and then followed the stranger to a table in the back corner. I sank into the booth across from him and forced a smile. I don't recognize you from around here. My name is Armand. I do not frequent such places often. I am trying something new. Armand. He smiled a real smile then, showing all his teeth in a way that reminded me of swamp gators. I glanced up as Johnny placed my drink down next to me, atop a fresh square napkin, and then faded away. I wasn't sure what to talk about. I felt out of place and like maybe I should have chosen to beat feet while I'd had the chance without seeming rude. Armand was good eye candy, hotter than hot but I just wasn't into him. What do uh, people do at places like this? My gaze shot back to him, and I narrowed my eyes. 
He'd been about to say humans. I knew it like I knew my own name. Was he a dragon like Cherry's new forever squeeze? Or was he maybe a different kind of creature? How did I ask something like that without sounding crazy? Are you okay? I nodded. In the interest of not looking like a complete lunatic, I supposed I'd just come out with strong hints. So, my sister, Cherry, just met a guy named Cesar. Armand suddenly grinned wider. Cesar's mate, Cherry, is your sister. Twin. So I take it you know my sister and Cesar? He nodded. She still has not learned to exclude the rest of us when she tries to push her thoughts to Cesar. I'm afraid I know way too much about your twin sister and Cesar. We all do. I laughed, aware of what he was saying. Cherry, once mated to a dragon, had gained the ability to communicate telepathically, but couldn't get the hang of focusing, so that she communicated her personal thoughts and feelings to Cesar alone. Instead, she tended to broadcast her private business to all the dragons. So, I guess that means you're a dragon? He sat up and puffed his chest proudly, then nodded back at me. As sure as I breathe fire. Chapter 2 Blaze Human bars. I did not like them at all. They smelled of male sweat and sour beer. The last several Armand had dragged us to had not even had any eligible women. We'd just ended up sitting around, drinking human beer that tasted like piss, and didn't do a thing to inebriate us. This time, I'd slipped a flask of Armand's special brew into my pocket before leaving my castle, but that wouldn't even be enough for me to pretend like I wanted to be at a human establishment searching for a life mate. I flew into town with a knapsack of clothes in my mouth and landed a quarter mile from the bar before shifting into my human form. I'd been spending so much time as a dragon lately, flying high, that standing on two legs almost seemed foreign. After dressing, I headed toward the bar Armand had chosen. As I approached, I was overcome with an odd sensation that froze me in my tracks. After rolling my neck a few times and stretching my shoulders, I looked around for an explanation, a source to explain the feeling. There was something in the air that was prickling my skin and bothering my dragon. He was agitated and antsy, not completely uncommon for him, but there was an added edge of discomfort. The closer I got to the bar, the more sensations mounted. I mentally called out to Armand, knowing by scent that he was already in the bar. Brother, is everything copacetic inside? Armand sounded downright cheery when he responded. Better than okay. This place contains a female. I told you this idea had merit, and the female is Cherry's sister. I blew out a sigh and ran my hands through my hair. One lone female? Wonderful, Armand. I knew I needed to find a mate, and I had hopes of being able to do that. But while I was looking, there was a worried gnawing that felt a bit like boulders tumbling in the pit of my stomach. There was always the possibility that I would not find a mate in time, and I would slowly lose my mind. If that happened, it would be hardest on my twin, Remy, having to put me down. The other dragons would, of course, leave the task to him. As unpleasant as it would be, he would view it as his duty. I didn't want that, of course, but I had another fear. What if I did find her and I wasn't mate material? What if I wasn't as different from my father as I'd always hoped? I was not ready. I should have been thinking about it for the past hundred years or so, but I couldn't help but avoid it. Remy felt the same way. Yet we were both showing up at these idiotic search nights, SOS nights as we deemed them, save our skins, because if we didn't find mates by the eclipse, we'd lose our skins permanently. They'd become dragon hide. As if on cue, Remy appeared at my side. Bro, dick. I was still angry at him for the stunt he'd pulled the week before. 
He'd challenge me to a wrestling match at my castle, and then when I was just about to emerge the victor, he'd taken out a wall. I'd been rebuilding it, but it took time to fly in supplies. Still pissy, I see. Still thinking of paying you a visit and burning your castle down before I leave. Do you really think I built my castle so flimsy and weak that your puny fire breath could damage it? Probably. He shoved me, and I caught myself, just before taking out the front door to the rundown tavern we were walking into. We were too big to go around leaning on tiny human things. The door looked like an average human male could break it down. The idea of it standing up to my weight was comical. As I entered, I was overtaken by the same feeling I'd had crawling up my spine when I'd landed. The air in the bar spilled through the open door, and I had to shake my head to clear it. I glanced over at Remy, who seemed unaffected. Do you feel that? He shot me a weird look and stepped ahead of me. Feel what? Over the smell of sour beer was something else. Something sweet. Like human desserts, fudge brownies with vanilla cream icing. My stomach growled. Despite the sensation that I was walking into something serious, I couldn't help following the delicious aroma. I hoped there were brownies at this bar. They were so much better than piss beer. I followed my nose and Remy to the back corner of the place and was just about to ask Armand if he was hiding dessert when Remy stepped aside and I found the source of the scent. Mate. My dragon roared in my head, and I found myself tongue-tied as I stared down at the most beautiful female I'd ever seen. Dark eyes, brown skin, black hair. I instantly craved her. The unease of potentially walking into a dangerous situation transformed into gratitude. My dragon stretched and preened, readying himself to display his strength battle worthiness and sexual prowess to win over his female. I was barely able to keep from shifting. I should have done something, said something, but I couldn't remember what it was that one did in such a situation. Smile, sit down, shake hands, express greetings. I just stared. I was in shock. I did not expect it would happen for me today. Blaze! I blinked a few times and tried to jumpstart my brain. I had to do something. Get it together, bro. You're acting bizarre. Remy's voice in my head did the trick. As he started to slide into the booth next to my mate, I growled, grabbed the back of his shirt, and pulled him away from her, pushing him toward Armand instead. I offered her a smile, the torn remnants of Remy's shirt hanging from my closed fist. He smells bad. You do not want to sit next to him. Her cheeks darkened with a tinge of blush as she glanced up and met my gaze. Beautiful eyes of the darkest brown with thick, dark lashes surrounding them held my stare, and her full lips parted in such a way that I could almost feel the soft, inaudible gasp that escaped them. When I shifted to face her, my knee brushed her leg. Electricity coursed to the spot where we'd connected, and I sucked in a shaky breath. Flaming scales that was intense. Hello, I'm Blaze. Your future. Her hands flew up to cover her cheeks, and she stammered. Is it warm in here? I mean, yeah, it is warm in here. That's why my cheeks are heated. It's stifling hot in here. I bit my bottom lip as I watched her mouth tumble around her quick words. Her lips were splendid, fuller and wider on the top. They begged to be kissed and stroked. My name is Blaze. Had I already said that? She pressed those extraordinary lips tightly closed for a moment and nodded. Of course, I'm China. I held out my hand, hoping to touch her, needing to touch her and nearly groaned when her small, delicate hand slipped into mine. Buzzing started behind my eyes and traveled all the way to my feet before centering in my dick. Her skin was so soft, and when she leaned into me, I could smell her sweet, chocolatey aroma even more. 
It was a game of torture. How long was I supposed to wait before I yanked her into my lap and sucked that top lip into my mouth? I should have studied human mating behaviors like Cesar had. Then I might know what to do, what to say, how to behave. Well, Blaze, I see you've met my new friend. Armand looked like he wanted to pout, but finally just shrugged. We have been getting acquainted discussing her job, and I'll shred you like a napkin if you do not shut up. As I quickly glanced at Armand, I forced a fake smile so China did not think I was rude. I focused back on her to gauge her reaction, hoping she was not uncomfortable. She'd been sitting alone with Armand, and now there were two more huge men sitting with her, myself included, blocking her in and sitting maybe a little too closely. Like she'd read my mind, she lightly touched my forearm. I'm going to run to the restroom if you'll let me out. I jumped into action, leaping out of the booth, pausing when we were standing side by side. She was slender and tall for a woman, but still much shorter than me. I fought the beast within that was telling me to lift her into my arms and run out with her. I had listened to some of what Cesar had preached to us about mating rituals in this world, so I knew I had to, oh, what was the phrase he used? Ah, yes, play it cool. I'll be right back. I watched her derriere sway as she crossed the bar, then turned back to Remy and Armand. Mine, she is my mate. What do I do now for fire's sake? Chapter Three, China. I yanked my phone out of my purse as soon as I stepped into the bathroom and called Cherry. She didn't answer the first time, but that didn't stop me from calling her again right away. Still no answer. Not until I tried another three times. I needed her input. When she finally picked up, she was out of breath and swearing. You better be dying right now, China. I met a dragon. Three of them. I'm thinking of sleeping with one of them. What? She barked an order away from the phone, but I was pretty sure she was telling Cesar to back off for a second. What dragons? Which one do you want to sleep with? His name is Blaze. My body is going crazy. I've never felt this way before, like ever. Tell me this is crazy. Tell me that I should go home and sleep this off. I blew out a wild breath, but didn't give her the chance to answer. Cherry, he's so hot. He's hot, and there's something about him that makes me want to strip naked right here in public and beg him to take me on the table. Oh, there might be enough room here in the restroom. I looked around the tight room and mentally mapped out the space. I imagined that if I leaned up against the sink and raised my leg in the air, I could prop my foot against the paper towel holder and... Smoldering flames! Cesar's voice rang out in the background. Why do you need my input? It sounds like you know what you want. Is he, um, a nice dragon? I hated the insecurity in my voice, but I couldn't help it. I didn't want to hook up with a guy and find out later he was a monster. Uh, well, Cesar? Cesar? Hang on, I'm asking Cesar. Not sure where he disappeared to. Cherry was quiet for a while, and then the sound of Cesar's laughter filled the line. When Cherry spoke again, her voice was filled with regret and anxiety. Uh-oh. What? I stared at my reflection in the mirror and held my breath. What do you mean, uh-oh? So... You know how I haven't quite gotten the knack of this telepathic dragon party line thing yet? I hissed. Cherry, what did you do? I was only trying to ask Cesar if Blaze would be sensitive, you know, for you to lose your virginity to. I don't know him well enough yet to give you an answer, she rushed on. I had to ask Cesar, and well, maybe Blaze didn't hear me. He heard. Cesar laughed again. Sorry, China, but we should hang up now. You will have a dragon hanging off of you any second now. And for the record, yes, Blaze is a worthwhile male. Oh, God, Cherry, I'm going to murder you. After you give birth to the perfect niece, you're dead. Nephew, 
Cesar growled. Or a niece, I shot back before hanging up. I shoved the phone back in my purse and assessed myself in the mirror. My eyes were dilated, and I could see my pulse fluttering at the base of my neck. I was also ruddy-cheeked from the embarrassment of knowing that Blaze was now aware I'd been asking my sister about him because I was considering propositioning him. That wasn't exactly smooth, but at least he knew where I stood. That's what the whole night had been about anyway. Mission, deflower China. If Blaze was willing, and I'd been picking up vibes that he was... I could lose my virginity to a sexy dragon with the hottest bod I'd ever seen. I couldn't deny the chemistry between us. It was electric. As soon as I'd spotted the man, it was like everyone and everything else in the room had faded away. My body had instantly reacted to his presence, and that was as good of a go-ahead as I really needed. Blaze was the first and only man I'd ever really been sexually attracted to, and boy, was I hella attracted. That meant green light full speed ahead as far as I was concerned. I took a few more minutes to reapply my lipstick and remove the tie that held my hair and finger comb it out. Halfway down my back, it was basically unmanageable while down, but I thought it left more of an impression than my normal ponytail. I swung it over my shoulders and slipped my purse back on my arm before nodding at myself in the mirror encouragingly. I could do it. It was just casual sex. Everybody was doing it. Some niggling in the back of my mind warned me that it might not be just a no-strings-attached hit-and-run. That was crazy thinking, though. Of course it would be just sex. For research purposes. With my mind made up, I raised my chin, took a deep breath, and pulled open the bathroom door and found Blaze there in the hallway, leaning against the wall directly across from the bathroom door. I should have been embarrassed. I should have been freaked out that he was just standing there waiting on me. Instead, I couldn't take my eyes off his. His irises had a reddish amber hue that was stunning, and I found myself moving closer to him, wanting to crawl as deeply into those eyes as I could. They almost matched his shock of flaming red hair. Your sister hasn't lost her flair for making group broadcasts. His low voice was barely more than a growl, but it echoed in my ears like he'd screamed at me. I shook my head. I'm thinking of disowning her. I am very pleased with what she has broadcast this time. Still, he stayed put, leaning against the wall in a way that made me want to grab his t-shirt and yank him to me. He seemed too calm, besides the husky voice. I wanted him to be just as addled as I was. I stepped closer to him, counting on the fact that he wanted what I wanted. If he didn't, he wouldn't be standing in the hallway alone and waiting, seconds after he'd learned that I wanted to sleep with him, right? What happens now? He flashed a predatory grin and pushed off the wall. Standing straight up, he towered over me. I was five foot eleven, which meant he had to be at least six foot five or six foot six. His unique eyes raked over my face, and then he lightly trailed his knuckle over my jaw, down my neck, and across my collarbone, teasing me in the most innocent of ways as it traveled, driving me crazy. My body felt the stroke of his knuckle through every nerve fiber. My core pulsed, and I realized with a start that my panties were damp and the dress I was wearing suddenly seemed indecent. My thighs felt slick, and I worried that with his enhanced shifter senses, he could smell how turned on I was. You tell me, China. What do you want to happen now? You know. I tugged my bottom lip into my mouth and held his gaze. Cherry simulcast it to the lot of you dragons. His grin was slow as he closed the distance between us, leaving only a gap of less than an inch. Electrical charges crackled and pulsed between us like a Van de Graaff generator. I do not want to hear it from Cherry. I want you to tell me. 
Someone came down the hallway, and I had to step farther into Blaze so they could get by. As my body pressed firmly against his, I sucked in a sharp breath and stared up at him. Sex. I want to have sex with you. A throat cleared behind us as the person walking by hadn't made it all the way past before I'd blurted out my confession. I was already beyond the point of being embarrassed. The way Blaze pulled me into his gaze was like a tractor beam, erasing everything surrounding us. His heavy-lidded expression was far too distracting to care about someone overhearing what I had to say. His large hands clasped my waist, and a puff of warm air drifted over my face as he swore. How close do you live? My car is in the parking lot. We can use the front seat. I wondered if there'd be room for both of us. Or the back seat, or the trunk, whatever. I wasn't feeling particularly picky. Matter of fact, I was feeling about as unpicky as a girl could be. I just wanted to do the deed, and I wanted to do it with him. I took another look at his massive chest and thick biceps. Will you fit in my car? He grinned. Probably not. Wanna try? Let's fly. Fly? His hand slid to my back, then lower, resting on the top curve of my ass. Fly. I let him lead me out of the bar, and we quickly jogged to an abandoned parking lot a few buildings over. The sun had set, and I should have been worried about following a strange man into the dark, but I knew I was about to see a dragon for the first time, and for that, I would have followed him anywhere. As long as it also included the promise to deflower me and make it as amazing as I'd always hoped it might be. Chapter 4 Blaze it was a novelty the way my heart was pounding in my chest. I was about to reveal my dragon form to my mate for the first time. Although I knew my dragon was a fantastic beast, my mate was a human. What if I scared her? What if she thought I was a freak or a hideous savage? Unwilling to give in to self-doubt, I spun around and caught China in my arms. Her body molded to mine so well. She was soft and silky smooth in the places her skin touched mine. With the swell of her breast pressed against my chest, I fought to keep my eyes on hers. Nervous? She shook her head. Are you kidding? I can't wait to see a dragon. I found it difficult to release her. But the sooner I shifted and flew us to my place, the sooner... I made myself let go of her and walked backward until there was enough room between us. Then I flashed her one last quick, reassuring smile before shifting. As my body morphed and transformed, I couldn't help thinking about how exciting it was that I'd finally found my mate. Less than an hour earlier, I hadn't been sure I was ready. But after seeing her gentle curves and glorious face, I now knew this was what I was made for. Her. I finished shifting and stood over her, my crimson dragon, tall and proud as she stood, eyes wide in amazement. I puffed out a ball of flames over her head to impress her, and huffed with laughter as she grinned and bounced on her feet. She was impressed. This is, you are, amazing. She came closer, not a trace of the fear or disgust I'd been concerned about. How do you do it? Where is all this mass when you're in man form? Where do your scales and wings and talons and fangs go? Whoa, that's a lot of fangs. You are huge, Blaze. Can I touch you? Without waiting for my response, too engrossed in studying me, she stroked her hands over my wings and gasped. They're delicate, like silk. I puffed out another ball of fire and growled at her. I wasn't delicate. I was a mighty and fearsome warrior. I could destroy the entire town in mere seconds should I choose it. Lightly giggling, she touched my scales. Not silky here, though. Hard as stone. Ah, uh, you're magnificent. I wanted to show her more, impress her further with my power and might, but she pressed her face into my wing and released a soft sigh. 
Her reaction made me feel like the strongest, most worthy dragon in all the worlds. I was so captivated and thrown off guard by the act that I almost didn't notice a human walking down the street toward us. Quickly, I turned my head back and nudged her, gesturing for her to climb onto the back of my neck. She understood instantly and wrapped her arms around as much of my neck as she could. Then she let out an ebullient string of laughter as I shot into the sky. I was sure we'd scared the hell out of some unknowing human walking home, but it was worth it to hear her laugh like that. She seemed so uninhibited and wild, so free. I was desperate to feel more of her and taste her and take my time savoring her. That desperation made me fly a little faster and a little wilder. I flew straight to my castle in the middle of a swamp and dipped dangerously low under the cover of trees to set her down on my dock. That was incredible. I shifted back and told myself to take it easy with her, but there was no use. I closed the distance between myself and a suddenly startled China. She clearly had not been expecting my nudity. I grabbed the back of her head and pulled her into me so I could slide my lips over hers. Flames of desire coursed from my mouth down to my cock and back up to my brain. The scent of her arousal was stronger. I inhaled through my nose and growled. My hand cupped her hip and tugged her tighter against my body as I ran my tongue over her bottom lip with the need to taste her. More fudge brownies and cream icing, vanilla, chocolate, and every tantalizing flavor that existed in the universe as she opened her mouth for me, allowing me to slip my tongue inside and sample her deliciousness. The world around us faded to nothing as her tongue tangled with mine. I was positive there was going to be a strip of scorched skin from my lips to my cock. I needed her fast. We could take our time later. I bent to grip the backs of her thighs and hauled her up against me. With our tongue still tangling, I walked down the dock to my front door. China's fingers ran down my back and back up, burying themselves in my hair, twisting and tangling against my scalp. She tugged at my hair and bit down on my bottom lip in a way so wild and primal, my knees weakened for a moment, and I stumbled through the doorway into my castle. I caught us before we hit the floor and kept us moving toward my bedroom. I had to navigate the space. I didn't want to trip on any of the piles of dirty laundry, construction supplies, or other debris tossed around the place. I wasn't the neatest dragon. My hand squeezed her ass tighter, and I kissed down her throat, teasing her until I felt her legs tighten, squeezing themselves around my waist. She wanted me just as much as I wanted her. As soon as I made it to my bedroom, I put her down on her feet and forced myself to step back and take a breath. Great balls of fire, I wanted to race to the finish line, but this was too important. I didn't want to hurt my mate, and I also wanted to prove my sexual prowess by pleasuring her. I needed to show her I was a worthy male. While I was trying to slow us down, China had other plans. She dragged her dress over her head and stood before me in just a pair of pale pink panties. When my eyes locked on her bare chest, she cupped her small breasts in her hands and raked her thumbs over her pebbled nipples. Dusky, brown, and puckered, they were begging for my attention. My mouth was suddenly dry. And when I tried to swallow, I had to clear my throat to accomplish it. I was struck stupid by how incredibly beautiful she was. I stepped closer and let out a shuddering breath. I was truly the luckiest dragon that lived. You are exquisite. Her lips curled in a smile, and she dropped her hands to the sides of her panties. With a slow tug, she slid them down her thighs and stepped out of them. Now we're even. I shook my head. We're nowhere near even. Come here. 
She stepped into my space and rested her hands on my chest. Her nipples followed a beat later, and her smile was so seductive, a groan escaped my lips. What do we do now, dragon? The innocent question contrasted with her sultry moves, combining to form an aphrodisiac. I cupped the sides of her neck and ran my thumbs over her throat. She was so delicate, so breakable, not like the dragon females of the old kingdom. I didn't know how much she could handle, what she was able to withstand, and I would die if I hurt her. I was so busy considering what to do first and what would and wouldn't be appropriate for my mate that I nearly shouted in surprise and pleasure as her hand encircled my cock and squeezed. I should have told her to stop. I should have concentrated on pleasuring her first. But she knelt in front of me before the words would come, and then her little hand was milking me while she licked her lips and looked up alluringly at me. It was all I could do not to claim her with my mark right then and there. This okay? I snorted a laugh and stroked her thick black hair, not quite believing what was happening. It is very, very okay. I lost all track of myself as China made love to me with her tongue. The suction she applied as her tongue stroked the underside of me was the purest form of pleasure torture. My head fell back, and I submitted to the little minx at my feet. Chapter 5, China Whatever sex goddess had taken over my body and was acting as a wanton seductress, I loved her. I looked up at Blaze through my lashes and saw him watching me with a strained look on his face. His shaft was perfect, but big. It was a little scary looking since I wasn't sure all that would fit in me, but I wasn't about to back out. I'd never wanted to do that to a man before. I'd never been turned on by the idea of pleasing a man in that way, in any way really. But on my knees in front of Blaze, watching his reaction, I felt like a queen. I need to taste you. Blaze's voice was rough as he grabbed me under the arms and hoisted me off my feet like I weighed nothing. He gently laid me on the bed and stood over me. His eyes were wide, and I wondered for a second if something was wrong. I was just about to ask when he spoke in a husky whisper, You are perfect. I couldn't help the sharp breath of air I sucked in when he knelt on the bed beside me. His body on display that way. I bit my lip and said a silent prayer of thanks for beautiful male dragons. Was it appropriate to pray? I took another assessing look. Nope. Whoever had crafted the body of the man leaning over me deserved praise. All cut muscles and rippled abs and stiff, hard manhood. Not to mention other fun things, like man nipples. I took advantage of him lowering himself to lean up and flick my tongue over his nipple. His gasp told me that he'd liked it. I did it again and then found myself pinned flat to the bed gazing up at Blaze, with my arms over my head, my wrists held firmly in one of his large hands. He was on his side next to me, his eyes melting me. I want this to last. I curled my leg over his and stroked my foot up the back of his calf. I want it to last too. He pinned my legs flat by throwing his thickly muscled thigh over them. Then you must behave. Behave? Why the hell did him telling me to behave turn me on? Maybe because I wasn't someone who normally behaved just because a man said so. I arched against his restraints and forced a glare at him. The hell I would behave. Even if the idea sent a fresh wave of desire flooding my core. Blaze leaned closer and brushed his lips over mine. His lips were gentle silencing, until they weren't. His kiss turned heated, and his tongue invaded my mouth. His hand gripped my wrist more tightly because I was tugging to get free. 
It was a scary thought in the back of my mind, realizing how easy it was for the big dragon to take control over my body. The scary thing was how much I liked it. I nipped his lip, displaying my dangerous side, and felt his warning growl from his chest. He kissed me harder, rough, brutish kisses that I was sure left beard burn across my skin. He nipped me back, leaving stinging swatches of skin as I stretched my neck up to him. He was punishing me for nipping him, oh, but what a punishment. My collarbone was devoured by his teeth, lips, and tongue. Then my chest, a fairly flat plane of skin, my breast being on the tiny side, nothing interesting that I'd ever noticed. Before Blaze, his tongue found places and things to do that I'd never before imagined. Between my breasts, Below my breasts, one giant hand cupped my breast and crushed it against the side of his face before doing the same with the other. I didn't even realize I had so much breast. I arched, pleading silently for more. I was so close to the edge and he'd barely touched me below the waist. As if sensing how desperate I was, Blaze took his time, prolonging my pleasure. I tugged at my wrists, trying to free myself, but Blaze ignored me. He moved at his own pace, methodical, yet passionate in his pleasuring of my body. When he finally closed his mouth over my nipple, it was in a hard tug and suck that made me scream out. My core pulsed, and I raised my hips, trying to get the slightest friction between my legs. I would come in a heartbeat with a mere touch. His thighs stayed locked over mine, though, and I was stuck on that precipice, trembling and close to tears from how badly I needed release. Then, sweetly, he lightened his suction and laved my nipples, pulling them against his tongue gently and flicking them until I cried out again. Even the gentle tongue flicks were torture. He moved lower still, nipping at the bottom swell of my breasts and across my rib cage. Each rib got special attention. Each dip and swell of my torso was worshipped. When he reached my navel, I groaned as his tongue dipped inside. He did it again and again until I shook. The fucking motion filled my head with more images, more images that I didn't need when I was already so close to breaking apart. Finally, his hand loosened on my wrists and then let go as he settled between my thighs, hooking them over his shoulders and pulling me up until my core was on full display to him and only my upper shoulders and head were still on the bed. I probably looked like part of a circus act, but I felt as though I was finally allowed a huge gulp of fresh air after being underwater for several minutes straight. He was going to let me come. I was going to get the release I needed. Put your hands on the top of your thighs and don't move them. His voice was dark and sharp like broken glass, but it was the most erotic thing I'd ever experienced. His need for me was clear in its timbre. I wanted to ask questions, take charge, boss him around, but I was too close to heaven, so I obeyed. I gripped the top of my thighs and nodded at him. I want to hear you, mate. I want to hear you scream for me. Not a fucking problem, I thought, as he parted my thighs and dragged his nose along my inner thigh. I held my breath and waited for the contact. Blaze had other ideas, though. He was still torturing me. He pressed his lips to the mound above my clit and then went back to my thighs. His tongue burned a wet trail all over my thighs and the crease near the apex of them. He nipped and sucked, lightly then heavily, until I was lifting my hips, wiggling in search of his mouth. I needed more. He worked at his own pace, however. Opening his mouth and taking the flesh of my folds in, he sucked and then let go with a pop. 
His teeth followed, and I cried out as his chin bumped into the center of my slit. I was so needy and desperate that I arched my back and lifted my hips, willing to take whatever I could get. Blaze tisked and leaned up so he could look into my eyes. Enjoy the ride, mate. I moaned and dug my nails into my thighs. Please, Blaze, I need more. Please, I need to come. Dropping his head, he flattened his tongue and stroked up my slit, only lightly dipping deeper to brush ever so slightly over my clit. Just when I thought I was going to remove my hands from my thighs and strangle him, he growled and forced his tongue into me, using it to fill me and fuck me. He swirled it as he squeezed his fingers into my hips, pulling me tighter into his mouth. I was lost. My head fell back on the bed, rocking back and forth. I did try to maintain some control. I really did. But I was already on the precipice and slipping over the edge. And then Blaze lifted his head. Tell me, my mate, is it the action of what's happening or that I'm doing it that's driving you so wild? Chapter 6 China It was the cocky assuredness with which Blaze spoke that should have turned me off, but it had the opposite effect instead. It fueled the flames already scorching me. I wanted to grab him by the hair and maneuver him to where I itched for him the most. But I obeyed and kept my palms where they were supposed to be as I licked my lips. Don't stop. His laugh was a dark rumble, and then his tongue was on me again more intense. He licked me in long strokes that started near my clit and didn't end until he was someplace I'd never imagined letting anyone go. The experience was dirtier and wilder than anything I'd ever thought I'd do, but I couldn't tell him no, not when my body was bending and bowing to his will. More pleasure and pain mingled when he focused his attention on my clit, taking the sensitive nub into his mouth and gently scraping it with his teeth before sucking and flicking his tongue over it. I was already so far gone that I couldn't stop the piercing scream that preceded my raging orgasm. It started in my toes, locking them in a painful curl, and then stiffened my entire body until the tension centered in my core and snapped. I felt moisture flood from me and the sensation of blaze lapping it up. My head spun, and I lost focus on the room as I succumbed to the dizzying ecstasy. It went on and on until I locked my knees around Blaze's head to get him to stop licking me for just a second. It was too much, too much sensation, too many lightning pulses from my clit. I hadn't even realized I'd grabbed his head until he pried my thighs open and looked up at me with hungry eyes. My fingers were entwined in his hair, pulling too tightly. I forced them to uncurl and let my arms fall to my sides. Limp and feeling dazed, I focused up at the ceiling and noticed that Blaze had large wooden beams up there, way up there. You taste like fudge brownies and vanilla cream, my favorite. He moved back up my body, lying on his side next to me. His eyes moved over my bare flesh, and his steel erection rested on top of my thigh, and damned if it didn't look even larger than it had before. When I reached to touch it, he took my hand and shook his head. Not yet. If you touch me, I'm bound to end this early. I bit my lip. That was so much better than I ever thought it could be. He cupped my breast in his hand and leaned over to press his lips to mine. Long and lingering, he let me taste myself on his tongue and then pulled back to meet my gaze. You are the most beautiful female I have ever seen. You take my breath away. 
I felt my cheeks go rosy and reached down to capture his shaft in my trembling hands. Something about the way he was staring at me hit me deeper in the feels than it should have. A one-night stand meant one night and no feelings. So why was this thing resembling deeper feelings bubbling up in my chest? Stupidity, that was why, no other reason. Well, that orgasm might have had something to do with it. Either way, I had to push it back down and focus on the task at hand. In hand. I want you, Blaze. He growled low in his throat and rolled us so that I was on top of him. Straddling him, his hard length was trapped between us, pulsing against my core. Rock against me like this. I gasped when he gripped my hips and shifted them forward and then backward. The motion rocked my clit against him in the most delicious way. My eyes instantly rolled back in my head and I leaned forward to brace my palms against his chest while picking up the pace of the movement. That's it, ride me, mate. I felt the same sweet tension building in me and rocked against him faster. Chasing another orgasm, I was surprised when Blaze flipped us over and then, in the same motion, thrust into me. He filled me completely in one go, and I let out a piercing scream as that orgasm I'd been chasing transformed into something more base and elemental, but so much bigger than I'd expected. My body burst open with a second of pain and then a swirl of pleasure and pressure of being so full of him. I clung to him to keep myself from falling or drifting away. I wasn't sure which. My fingers in his back, my teeth in his shoulder. I held on as he growled and buried his face against my neck. Fuck, mate, this isn't going to last long. It wasn't until dots appeared in front of my eyes that I realized I wasn't breathing. Forcibly, I sucked in a huge breath, holding onto Blaze even tighter. My core pulsed nonstop, competing with my heart to see which could go faster. When he slowly slid out and back into me, I gasped and cried out his name. It was heaven. Another slow thrust and then another. Blaze picked up the pace with each until he was thrusting into me fast and hard. One hand was behind my head with a firm grip on the back of my neck. The other had a death grip on my hip. He lifted his head and gazed down at me with glowing eyes and a look of barely held control. Golden veins glowed from under his skin, which itself was fading in and out a deep blood red color. Those strange reddish-amber eyes had turned a glowing red-gold, a shade that I'd only ever seen at a glass-blowing exhibit. Stunning. If I could have concentrated on anything other than the never-ending orgasm I was experiencing, I would have told him that he was the most incredible thing I'd ever seen. His hint of beard as he kissed me, his grip as he thrust into me, the way he growled as he slid out of me. It was all too much. Any second I was going to shatter into a million pieces and cease to exist. His thrusts continued, faster, harder. His finger threaded into my hair and pulled my head to the side. And then his lips were gone, closing on my neck instead. Then, teeth blinding pleasure zapped me like a bolt of lightning. Blaze thrust into me once more before his seed shot in pulses, coating my inner walls as his teeth sank into my neck. I raked my nails down his back and screamed. It was exactly what I needed. As the wave of orgasm I'd been riding crashed, I knew I'd never be the same. Painful tension finally broke like a faulty dam, and I sailed back down to earth gently as my core milked every last drop from Blaze. My brain was mush. The condom still in my purse? Oopsie. My fear of pregnancy? 
Oh, well. The fact that the strange dragon I'd gone home with was slowly removing his teeth from my neck and licking what was surely my blood? Whatever. I was zen. I'd found my tranquil place. I passed out with Blaze still inside of me. Chapter 7, China Get walking before this turns awkward. That was my first thought upon waking and finding myself wrapped in the arms of a giant of a man who could also turn his impressive physique into a majestic, awe-inspiring dragon. Blaze growled in his sleep behind me, his body moving against mine with each deep breath he took in. His somehow still erect shaft was pressed firmly against my ass cheek, and I felt the moisture of his seed still inside of me. I needed to get to a bathroom, get cleaned up, and then get the hell out of there. It may have been my first time, but I did know one rule about one-night stands. You didn't stick around. Yet, I wanted to. I wanted to stay wrapped in his arms. They were so comforting and strong. There was ink decorating the one draped over me. Lines and curves made up a detailed tribal artwork that I could have stared at for hours. I wanted to remain safely ensconced in his arms, staring at the tattoo for hours. Then I wanted to wake him up and have a replay of the night before. I was sore between my thighs, but I was also horny again, big time. I had to get out, though. I wasn't about to look like an unbalanced stage five clinger in front of one of Cesar's friends. That would be mortifying. My mission had been accomplished. I'd lost my virginity as planned, and I could walk away feeling like I'd reached and surpassed a milestone. All was well. I was well. I forced myself to slip under the arm the size of a tree trunk and slide out of bed so I could creep around looking for my clothes. It was then that I noticed for the first time that the room was a wreck. It looked like the debris a hurricane left in its wake. There were stacks of brand new clothes waist high. T-shirts, jeans, socks. They still had the tags on them, but the rest of the room was a mess. Piles of dirty laundry, black plastic trash bags half full of clothes, and a layer of dust that had to be half an inch thick. As I made my way around the room, weaving through the maze of dirty dishes, kicking aside pizza boxes, and walking on a bed of laundry, dude, hire a cleaning service. Amazingly, I was able to recover all my clothes and both my shoes. On the other side of the bed, I could see Blaze's strong back still bore the hint of the scratches that I'd put there several hours ago. I was sure they had been much deeper. He healed mighty fast. At that point, they just looked like dull memories. I had the unexplainable urge to refresh them. I was nuts. I tiptoed out of the room with my clothes in my arms so as not to risk waking him. I figured I'd dress in the hall. Imagine my surprise when I found the rest of Blaze's home in a similar state of chaos and filth. Hello, Hurricane Katrina. By the time I finished dressing as quickly as I could, I'd stepped outside and gotten cherry on my cell. Well, hello, you shameless slut. I snorted. Not now. I'm in no mood for jokes. I need a ride. I need to get out of here. But I'm not sure where I am exactly. She was quiet for a few moments. China, is everything okay? Did Blaze hurt you? Not in any ways that I hadn't thoroughly enjoyed. No, I just don't want to still be here when he wakes up. I'd like to avoid the awkwardness of the morning after, if you know what I mean. Are you sure? I can't imagine he would have brought you to his castle if he didn't plan on spending the morning with you. Every morning. Come on, Cherry. Can't you send your flying dragon to Uber me? No way. You're not riding on the back of my dragon. Get your own dragon. Matter of fact, go back inside and use your uber dragon. You're adopted. We're twins. Whatever. Just come and get me, Cherry, please. And hurry. I was running scared and I knew it. 
Something about the night before had gotten under my skin like nothing else ever had. It was though I could feel Blaze's imprint forming on me. I didn't do those kind of attachments, though, and the whole thing was highly uncomfortable. Highly. We'll come get you in his boat. He has a really big boat. I had a feeling she was looking at Cesar while talking to me and playing the double entendre game with him. I fake gagged. Just hurry, okay? Fine, she sighed. You owe me, though. I hung up and ran my hands over my face. Crusted mascara flaked into my eyes, and I blinked rapidly to try to save myself from blindness. The view from Blaze's dock was spectacular. Cypress trees dotted the marsh, and dead, decaying branches poked through the surface of the algae-covered water. Although the water was as still as a sheet of light green glass, I knew that underneath, wild creatures went about their secret lives. As if on cue, a hissing sound echoed from somewhere nearby, prompting me to take a few steps back toward the house, or castle, as my sister had said the dragons called their domiciles. I knew plenty about Louisiana wildlife, enough to know better than to welcome a problem. I leaned against the side of Blaze's castle, next to a section that was clearly under construction, and waited for Cherry and Cesar to show up. I had to fight the urge to go back inside and curl up to Blaze, an urge that increased with every passing second. The night before had been so much more than I expected it could be. No wonder the entire world was so into sex. I finally understood the pull. I guess I just need to find the right person. Dragon, whatever. A huge part of me wanted to spend the morning waking up next to Blaze. Warm feelings stirred in my chest at the thought. Ugh, that huge part of me was dumb. She couldn't be trusted. By the time I saw the boat cutting through the still water, heading toward the dock at the edge of the property, the huge dumb part of me had halfway convinced the reluctant running away part that I should just head back in and see what would happen if I did stick around. That thought sent red flags flying in all directions, and I sprinted down the dock just as Cherry and Cesar got closer. They'd barely pulled up to it in their bateau when I jumped into the boat. It rocked dangerously, but settled quickly. What's the rush? Cesar looked toward the house and frowned. Did Blaze do something not to your liking? My face blushed. I'd liked what he'd done very much. Um, oh, wow. I recognize that look. She's been screwed stupid. Cherry smiled at Cesar. I've worn it myself a few times. Cesar's brow furrowed. Only a few? Would you two stop? I smacked Cherry and shook my head. Blaze was great. I just need to get home. I have work. Cesar glanced at my neck, and his eyebrows went up. Are you certain you wish to leave? When I ran my hand over the spot he was staring at, I remembered Blaze biting me. What? What is it? He looked at Cherry and nodded to my neck. Cherry looked and screamed, Oh my God, he claimed you. I wanted to strangle her. If you keep screaming, you're gonna wake him up and I won't be able to sneak away, so hush. Let's just get on with my boat ride of shame. No more talking, please. They allowed that rule to stand for less than two minutes. If he marked you, why are you leaving? I glared at my sister. Just because a guy gives you a hickey doesn't mean you have to stay with him all day, Cherry. Hickey? Cesar looked confused. Cherry smiled sweetly at her mate. It's a sucking mark, vaguely resembling a bite mark. Well, more like a strong kiss, not a claiming mark. What are you two talking about? I glanced back the way we'd come. I could still see the outline of Blaze's huge home. Why did that make my chest ache? You know what? Forget I asked. We're dropping this right now, not another word. I'm going to catch flames from Blaze for this, Cesar sighed. He claimed you, China. That means you're his mate. Like, 
his wife only more. Lifelong, live for centuries together, connected telepathically mate, like me and Cesar. That huge dummy in me that wanted to stay and curl back up to Blaze grew brighter with hope, but I squashed her down. No way. Yes. Cherry moved closer to me, rocking the boat. I was so worried, China. I was scared that I would lose you in a few decades and have to live for another thousand years without you. I even had nightmares of being young and healthy and having to watch you grow old and die. An optimist always. I'm serious. Mates of dragons live as long as the dragons they're mated to. These dragons are hundreds of years old, China. Hundreds of years. I didn't want to live that long without you. When Cesar huffed, she smiled at him and batted her eyes. Of course, I have you to comfort me, mate. Whoa, hold your horses, sis. Blaze is not my mate. Blaze most definitely is your mate. That mark on your neck proves it. Cesar nodded to my neck again. And from the way your neck is not on, he may have lost control a bit. His dragon did a number on you. No. Yes. Cherry clapped her hands and then leaned back on her end of the boat. She smiled, a pleased and satisfied smile. I wonder what the world will be like a hundred years from now. Hopefully the internet connection at our castle will be faster. I shuddered. I had to try to get my stagnant life flowing again by dipping my toe in a moving current. But instead, I'd freaking fallen headfirst into an undertow. And despite me flailing to get myself back to dry land, I was being pulled farther under, drowning. Chapter 8, Blaze I felt the empty ache before I'd even become completely conscious. Something was wrong. I rolled over to find my mate, and she was not there. My dragon let out a massive roar, and I was on my feet still naked, roaming my castle. She was gone. Someone had taken her. I sniffed the air and was shocked to find the scent of Cesar and his mate. You will pay. Cesar's laughter rang in my head, and I looked around for anything to pound my fists against. She called my mate and demanded we come and get her. Do you need lessons on satisfying your female, brother? I exploded in a fiery ball of fury and took to the sky as my dragon. I would find Cesar and challenge him to a battle. Cherry's thoughts were pushed into my addled brain. It's not Cesar's fault. My sister doesn't know that you're mates. You should have explained that. You're gonna have to work on her. I'd found Cherry's unexplained visits to my head humorous before when she was poking fun at Cesar. But at this moment... I was infuriated. She is my mate, she should know. I should not have to court her. I felt Cherry sigh in my head. It's not always that easy. It is that easy. Dragon finds mate. Mate accepts dragon, the end. Cesar growled. Watch yourself. Speak more nicely to my mate, or I will accept your battle challenge. I blocked any further communication and soared higher in the sky. I knew I needed to talk to them more and figure out what was happening with my mate. But I didn't trust that I wouldn't attack Cesar at first sight. He had assisted my mate in leaving me. Why would my mate want to leave me? I knew I'd pleased her the night before. She'd cried out during multiple orgasms and I had felt her body respond. Her leaving did not make sense to me. I knew Cesar always talked about modern human women in this world, but the females on Earth weren't that different from the dragon females in the old world. When they felt that mate calling, it had to be the same. It was strong, forceful, and it changed everything. My own mother had left her parents and siblings right away for my father. She'd been pregnant with us twins within the first month after she'd arrived at my father's kingdom. 
It should have been that simple. Mates mated. Cherry and Cesar are telling me that I, a mighty dragon warrior, a king, must quarter like a flaming coward. I will not. I soared higher, where the air was sparse. Higher, where my fire struggled against the thin, cold air. I didn't look down at my new home. I rarely did when I flew that high. I could almost pretend we were still in the old world. Everything was simpler then, especially in my kingdom. Everyone had a role, and they filled it without question. No one ran from their roles. It's different with human women, Blaze. Beast and I had to win our mates over. You must prove to her that you are worthy of her risking her heart with you. I growled at Cesar's interference. I didn't want his opinion. I knew Beast and Cesar had to fight for their mates, but they are weak. They're not of the Crimson Dragon lineage. I'd heard plenty of things about their kingdom from my father. It was as different as possible from my home. My father had always said that they were not true warriors. Even though my father had been gone for over a hundred years, his harsh voice still echoed in the back of my mind. I tried not to think less of Cesar. He was a friend, after all. But I would not take advice from a soft, cowardly dragon like him about claiming my mate. Well, I wouldn't take any more advice from him. It was just by chance that I'd met my mate while following his advice about searching in places humans found their mates. It took hours to calm down just enough to descend to a normal flying height. I was furious. If I delved into what I was feeling enough, I knew there would be hurt underlying the anger, but I wasn't ready to let go of the anger. My mate had chosen to leave me. Despite what Cherry and Cesar said, my mate should have stayed. I thought back to my parents. Remy and I had grown up in our royal palace. Although we'd had servants, assistants, nannies, and maids, the only other mated pair I witnessed was my parents. Their mating was, remembering it conjured a sick feeling in the pit of my stomach. It was not at all the type of mating I wanted with China. If that was what China and I were destined to become, perhaps I should just let her go. Shame washed over me. Maybe I was better off without her. No, maybe she was better off without me. But my heart could not accept that. I was not my father. I would not have a mating like he had with my mother. There had to be another way. Something I could say for the new world we'd landed in was that it was much lusher than my old home. Green vegetation covered everything, even where we'd chosen to stay, in the swamps and marshes. In the old world, a place so surrounded by water wouldn't be as green. Plants and trees drowned and died out once the waters took over. The new world was so different from my home. It was hard to accept that the old world was gone to us, even after nearly a hundred years away from it. Remy and I had been kings. All of us had. Virtual gods in our own kingdoms. Here in the new world, we hid our true natures. It didn't feel right. I wasn't over my brooding, I decided. Flying higher again, I let out a short burst of flames and growled. I was mixed up. I wanted my queen. She was mine. She was destined to be at my side. I couldn't help feeling bitter because things had not gone the way I'd planned. More thoughts of my father filled my head, and it was all I could do to stay in the air. Shaking my head and thrusting my wings, I tried to outfly those thoughts. Everything about China was perfect. Except maybe her stubbornness. I didn't know. We had barely spoken. I didn't know what she was like outside of the bedroom. It did not matter in the end, because I would have her as my mate no matter what. I longed for her. And whether I agreed with Cesar's approach or not, 
My dragon and I had waited for hundreds of years for a mate. And now that I knew who she was, I no longer had the patience to wait. I would find her myself. Chapter 9, China There was a cloud of gloom hanging over my head for the rest of the day. I'd showered away all traces of Blaze once I got home, but I still felt him with me. I could almost feel his annoyance with me, too, dark and angry, hovering over me like a disapproving authority figure. Right over the spot he'd left his mark on me, the mark that I couldn't wash off. Working had been a pipe dream, but I'd still gone out into the bayou to try. I had a few posts set up in different parts of the swamp near my home that I needed to check regularly. I'd traveled the world, but the bayous of Louisiana were where my heart lived. And not just because I was born and raised in the state. In my opinion, the wetlands of the Deep South were one of the most incredible places on Earth. I was more comfortable in the bayou than most people were in their own living rooms. I was currently in the process of experimentation, trying to develop a few different strands of produce that would thrive in the wetlands of our part of the country. My long-term goal was to eventually provide a new industry for the bayou folk I'd grown up around. It was my side project. Usually I traveled to different places in the country, the world even, to work on growing various crops or to study the flora of different locales and climates. I held a degree in horticulture, and I frequently worked with other horticulturists, botanists, and plant genome engineers whose names were decorated with more diplomas and were followed by more initials than mine, but who didn't possess my green thumb. In fact, I was frequently praised by colleagues who claimed that I could make a lily pad grow in the desert. What I couldn't do was figure out what kind of animal kept messing with the post farthest from my house. Every time I made it back to the little hut, something had scratched at the door until the lock gave. It had been getting inside and rooting around, killing any chances I had at getting the seeds to germinate and grow. Annoyed and ready to call it a day, I figured I'd give it one more look-see before going home and crawling into bed. I made my way to the back of the hut to pick up the lantern I kept there for the occasions when I lost track of time, worked too late, and got caught out in the swamps and marshes after sundown. It was already getting dark outside, and I knew that by the time I got halfway back home, it would be pitch black, and I was more likely to stick my foot in the mouth of a gator than to land it safely on my back porch. I fumbled around and retrieved the pack of matches from a supply box under the lantern, removed a single match, and struck it. As soon as I did, I realized my mistake. The lantern was holding liquid in its grooves, a place that should have been dry. Had the lamp oil leaked out somehow? As the realization crossed my mind, it was followed quickly by a second realization. The liquid wasn't kerosene. It was gasoline. How had I not noticed the smell? I'd been too distracted by trying not to think about Blaze. What happened next was like a scene from Final Destination. I felt like death itself had suddenly arrived to play a starring role in my life. I dropped the lantern onto its shelf too fast. It wobbled, and just when I thought it would stay upright... It tipped forward and crashed to the stony ground. The match in my other hand continued to burn while I watched in horror as the lantern shattered. When the flame licked at my fingers, I startled, dropping the match. The burst of fire that shot up shocked me enough that it sent me reeling backward. I stepped onto the shattered lantern and screamed when a huge shard of glass pierced my boot and found its way into the arch of my foot. It was deep and painful, but my immediate concern was the fire continuing to spread around me. The flames grew too big too fast. Even in my panic state, I was aware that the fire pattern wasn't a natural progression. All that gasoline, how had I not smelled it? 
My hut was small and made of old wood that seemed excited to burn. Before I could hobble across the space, the whole place seemed to be up in flames. My heart raced, and I sucked in lungs full of thick smoke that reeked of burning gasoline and lighter fluid. I sank to the damp earth and crawled toward the door. It wasn't far, a few feet. Even with the pain shooting up my leg, I could make it. As long as I could breathe and get out, I'd be fine. But a split second before I reached it, the door became consumed in flames. My brain raced through exit strategies. I'd been in a few dangerous situations before, and I wasn't one to allow panic to overtake and immobilize me. The little room burned hotter, though. I was trapped inside a furnace. My face felt like it was roasting, and the air was so thick with smoke it caused tears to stream down my face. I gasped in smoke-filled air and screamed as loud as I could, hoping someone would hear me. How had it escalated so fast? Mere seconds had passed, but everything around me was burning. My seeds were at the edge of the hut, planted directly in the damp soil. I moved toward them and dug my hands in the mud, relieved to find a respite from the heat for a second. Desperate and fighting for my life, I grabbed handfuls of mud and rubbed it over my burning face and hair. I tried to bury myself in it, accepting that I wasn't getting through the burning door. I burrowed deeper and sobbed as fire licked at my skin. Even with the dire set of circumstances I was in, I knew I wasn't going to die. Later, I would realize how crazy that was, but in my head at the time, surrounded by fire, I thought I could just bury myself in the cool mud and wait for the fire to burn itself out. I never considered how close I was to death or just how much pain I was in. I cried as I dug my feet into the mud, and the glass seemed to wedge deeper into my foot, yet I knew it would all be okay. And it was. The mark on my neck started to burn hotter than the fire around me. Blaze. I gasped and choked on mud and black smoke, but it was quickly replaced with fresh, well, fresher air, as the entire burning hut was raised skyward, vanishing from around me. It landed 50 yards away, where it sank halfway into the water. Blaze, the giant red dragon that he was, hovered over me, a very panicked look on his huge dragon face. He threw back his massive head and let out a roar that shook the ground. I was so relieved to be able to breathe that I forgot about the pain I was in. I pulled myself from the mud and struggled to my knees. You, you saved me. Blaze transformed in front of me. The act was dizzying in my current state. No, 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 China, oh, China, stay with me, stay with me, mate. I let him pick me up. The moment I was in his arms, the world seemed to settle back into place. His big body was cool against me, and his touch was so gentle. I knew that he'd take care of me. I knew I could stop worrying now. I must take you to a human healer, a doctor. Where does one find a doctor? He sounded so panicked different from anything I'd observed from him before, and I didn't like it. I'm okay, Blaze. I just need a shower and maybe a couple of Band-Aids. Hospital? Why do none of us know where a flaming hospital is? I rested my head on his shoulder and smiled up at him. Blaze, I'm fine. Just take me home and hose me off. It was around then that I realized that I must have been in shock or something. Take me home and hose me off? If I was rational, I might have agreed that a hospital seemed like a good idea. Well, maybe. But Blaze's shoulder felt like the best pillow ever. And I was quickly losing touch with consciousness. Oh, well. Chapter 10, China. Wherever Blaze had taken me, I thought about suing them. I kept waking up in a world of pain and then passing out again. Each time I regained more awareness, 
enough to know that my sister was there, and she was being really loud for a librarian. Screaming. She was screaming incoherent things. I made a mental note to tell her to use her indoor voice once I could talk again. When my boot was removed, I moaned in pain, then lost consciousness again. When I finally woke up for good later, I remembered that more than anything, the pain in my boot coming off and the glass ripping out of my foot with it, my whole body hurt. Parts that I hadn't known I possessed hurt. Parts that had no reason to hurt hurt. I felt like I'd been scrubbed with a cheese grater. Was I raw and blistered? I'd never been a vain person, but the anxiety of wondering how I looked settled in my stomach and stayed there. It took me a while to open my eyes. I was so darn tired. When I did, though, my eyes felt scratchy and as achy as the rest of me. Maybe a little more. The first thing I saw was Blaze sitting next to me, his elbows resting on the side of my bed. His bed. I was in his bedroom, back in his castle, back in his bed. His head was hanging low, and his shoulders were hunched forward. He looked older than the last time I'd seen him, and exhausted. Like he could feel me looking at him, he jerked and sat up straight. When he noticed me watching him, he leaned in and pressed a hard kiss on my forehead. Something wet landed on my cheek, and before I could tell if he was really crying, he stood up and vanished from the room. In his place, my sister appeared, her own eyes red and swollen. You scared the hell out of us. What were you doing out there? What happened? God, China, you could have died. I held my breath as she sobbed against me, that realization hitting me. I could have died. I suddenly felt as though an elephant had traipsed into the room and found that the only place suitable to sit was my chest. Death had never been a thought before. Obviously, I knew it would come eventually, but that was the closest I'd ever come to it. I think you're hurting her, mate. Cesar's soft voice was gentle as he pulled Cherry away from my bed. She is probably sore. I shook my head, ignoring the pain, and reached out for her. When she rushed back to my side, wrapping my arms around her did hurt, but I needed to feel reassured for the moment. Don't you ever scare me like that again. Just when I stopped worrying about losing you, you go and nearly die on me. Cherry stroked my hair and groaned. There's still mud in your hair. I could not get it all out. Blaze's gravel-filled voice came from the corner. I guessed he'd hadn't left the room after all. I will try again when she's feeling up to it. I let Cherry go and tried to sit up. Blaze was right beside me in a flash, though, resting his hand on my shoulder and pushing me gently back down. You are not well enough to get up yet. I tried to speak and found my throat was sore and burning. I cleared it and tried again. I was able to produce a hoarse resemblance to my voice. I want to sit up. He stared down at me, his face hard, and shook his head. You must rest. You need to sleep. Cesar and your sister are leaving. What? I never said. Cherry started, but was cut off by Cesar. Let's give them some time, mate. Your sister needs her rest. He shifted his gaze to Blaze. And her mate needs time to get himself under control. I studied Blaze. His lips were pressed together tightly, and his expression radiated tension and high stress, as though he was barely holding himself together. Blaze. My voice wasn't any stronger, but it got Blaze's attention. He looked down at me and blew out a big breath. Shaking his head, he brushed his hands over his face. I will let you know when she wakes up again. Cherry hugged me again and pressed a kiss to my forehead. I love you. Feel better. Then she brought her mouth closer to my ear so I could hear her whisper. At least I know you're in good hands. He hasn't left your side for a second. I wanted to respond, ask her questions about that, but I was already fading. Sleep 
tugged at me like a toddler at a sleeve. I fought it as much as I could, but Blaze was right. Sleep was the best option. I awoke briefly a few more times during the night. Blaze was always there beside me, ready to do whatever I needed. Twice I needed help to the bathroom. Once he held my hair back as I sat up with a jerk and violently threw up all over myself. I'd had a nightmare of the fire and of dying. After I was finished, he held me in the bathtub and gently ran cool water over my skin until I was clean. I was never fully awake enough to appreciate any of it. I went out as fast as I came to each time, all of it more like a fever dream than reality. When morning came, though, I was rested. I woke up still feeling rough around the edges, but more myself. I was present and aware of my surroundings. I was aware I was in Blaze's castle, the place I'd tried hard to get away from, with the man I'd snuck away from, the dragon who'd saved me from burning alive, the man who'd sat at my side the entire night and took better care of me than a mother would her newborn baby. You were awake. I turned my head to find Blaze sitting by the large windows that looked out at the lime green swamp. I couldn't help but appreciate the view. A few cranes moved around the cypresses, darting in and out between the morning sun and shadows. But the real view was the man sitting in the chair. As I studied him, I felt my breath catch in my chest. Backlit as he was, I could see a ring of gold around his red hair. His face was in the shadows, but the fatigue in his expression was clear. That huge dummy in me felt something akin to butterflies at the sight of him. You saved me. He stood up and walked over to me. You left, and then you almost killed yourself. I nodded. There was no point in arguing with his obviously sour mood. He wasn't wrong. I had left. Then I had almost accidentally gotten myself killed. He was right. Although he said it as though I'd meant to do both, like he was angry at me for both things. Tell me what happened. When I got there, I smelled gasoline and other accelerants. The bed dipped as he sat next to me. Did you do that? No, of course not. Why would I do that? Why did you leave me? I tried to sit up. Arguing with him while lying down seemed unfair. When I pressed my feet against the bed to leverage myself, the pain in my right foot was so shocking, I saw stars for a second. I gasped and instantly stuck it back out, trying to alleviate that pain. Blaze growled and caught my leg. Careful. I'm not trying to hurt it. So you are this graceful naturally? I hissed at him, anger getting the best of me. Get out. It is my home. Then... I'll get out. I tried to sit up again and managed to get halfway upright before Blaze's big hand landed in the middle of my chest and pushed me back down. He was gentle, too gentle. It felt like a caress. You will stay this time, whether you like it or not. I growled, and to my surprise, he growled right back at me. Only his growl was fierce and shook the house. Deflated, I sank back into my pillows and sighed. I guess I'll stay a little longer. Chapter 11, Blaze. I still had not come to terms with the horror of hearing China's cries and seeing the smoke and rising flames. Realizing she was in the midst of it had been the worst, most frightening moment of my entire existence. I had a lot of terrible moments to call on, plenty that would have cracked a weaker dragon. Finding China that way had topped all of them. If I didn't focus, my hand still shook and my heart still pounded out of control. My dragon paced like a caged animal. She was so small and helpless. She'd been a tiny lump on the ground, 
coated in dark mud that at first I thought was her burned cracked skin. She was still helpless as a kitten, yet she was already fighting with me. More of that stubborn streak. But if that stubbornness of hers kept her alive, I loved every bit of it. I stood up and stared down at my tiny mate under the layers of blankets. Her injuries could have been so much worse. Her skin was red-tinged and tender, as though she had a bad sunburn. Her foot was the worst. She'd be fine, I knew, but it was harder to convince my dragon. He demanded revenge. If China hadn't poured that gasoline around, someone else had. She'd almost died. Someone would pay. You must eat. I will make you breakfast. I did not want to leave her, even for a few minutes, but she needed sustenance to heal. In my kitchen, I grabbed a few things I thought would make a decent meal. I was not a cook or a cleaner. Dirty dishes were piled high in the sink. Usually, rather than clean them, I just threw them away and bought more, just as I did with clothes. Now that I had a mate, though, she would do cooking when she was healed. Until then, she would have to deal with whatever I could throw together, which was not much. An egg, maybe some burned toast and a hunk of sausage cooked by dragon fire. When I made it back to my bedroom, China was sitting up, frowning at me. I sighed and put the food down in front of her. What? I want to go home. Anger bubbled up inside. I would care for her. I had to care for her. I would not even be able to keep my dragon stable if I was not near to her to assure myself she was okay. You are home. This is your home now. Her eyes widened and she shook her head. No, no, my home is still my home. This is your home. And I shouldn't be hanging out here for days on end. You live here now, with me. We can move your stuff here when you feel better. Or we can buy you new stuff. I pushed the food closer. You should eat. The sooner you rebuild your strength, the faster you will heal. I must still be dreaming. China pushed the food back at me and threw her good foot over the side of the bed to try and get up. This is insane. We had one night together, one great night, one fantastic night, but still, only one night. I'm not moving in with you. While I appreciate you saving my life, I don't owe you anything for it. You can't keep me here. Call my sister. I want to go home, now. I easily caught her before she could stand and pulled her into my lap. Stop. You cannot go anywhere right now. You can't keep me here. I can and I will. I pressed my face into the crook of her neck and felt her body tighten against mine. This mark, you are mine, China. Even if you were not, I would not release you right now. You are injured. You must rest and... You should not be alone. It means, she cleared her throat. It means nothing. It's just a hickey. I gripped the back of her neck and moved her so that she was sitting across my lap and staring into my eyes. Just a what? A hickey. It's nothing. She blinked too fast and looked away, lying. She knew that mark wasn't nothing. I pulled her into me even tighter and pressed my lips against hers. Instantly, her arms went around my neck and her hands tangled in my hair. Pulling back just enough to meet her gaze, I licked my lips and fought for control. Not nothing. We were made for each other. My mate. We belong to each other. Forever, China. Her eyes cleared and a fire appeared in them, not dissimilar to the fire she'd been trapped in. Placing her hands against my chest, she shoved, fighting to get off of me. To avoid hurting her, I gently put her down in the bed and stood above her, unhappily glaring at her. What now? What is wrong with you? Currently, 
I have a crazy mate who can't stop fighting about the simplest things. The simplest things? I will provide you with an easy life, mate. You do not know the things some mated females go through. Not all dragons are easy. We are not all roses and sunshine like Cesar. I picked up a plate of food and tried to hand it to her again. I will not require of you the things some men do. I wish for things to be easy for you. Tears filled her eyes and my chest felt like it was cracking open. My mother had cried. Only when things were really bad. I was not treating her badly, though. Not that I thought. So why was she crying? Easy for me? So you think I should just move in and do what? Shop and paint my nails? Of course not. There will be household things for you to do. I do not cook or clean well. You will take care of that. Mostly we will just spend our time together, enjoying being mates. In the blink of an eye, her plate was flying back at my head. I ducked and growled. What in fire's sake? China sat up higher, her entire body tense. I don't care what you think you are to me or I am to you. Get the fuck out. Or call my sister and get me the hell out of here. I'm not your maid. I'm not giving up my life and moving in here because you need a fucking servant. Male chauvinist asshat. Of course, Cherry gets the amazing dragon, and I'm stuck with the sexist dragon whose ideas are stuck in the last century. Shocked by her outburst, I stepped back. You think Cesar is a better mate? A patch of grass would be a better mate. Get out. I'd rather my foot fall off than stay here for another second. Get my sister here, or I'm going to snap, and then you really won't like me. This behavior must toast your marshmallows if you expected a mate to act like a subservient, proper little demure housewife, daintily wiping your ass and having dinner out on the table for you when you get home. Why are you still standing here? Out! Faced with a female who'd clearly lost her mind, I backed away with my hands raised. I did not know what had angered her, but she was livid. That rage would have scared anyone. I swallowed no pride in rushing out. Standing outside of my bedroom, I dragged my hands down my face and groaned. My mother had never acted like that. She had always just done her tasks and been happy to take care of the castle and her children. I tried to imagine what my father would have done if my mother would have screamed at him and thrown a plate at his head the way China had. Curiously, the thought almost brought a smile to my face. I would have enjoyed seeing that. My father would have been incensed, though, and the punishment would have been swift and harsh. My China would never be treated that way. Thoughts of my mother and father killed any last vestiges of joy I harbored. I headed outside to give China some space and to talk to my brother. Chapter 12, China. Fuming, I wasn't sure what had just happened. I looked at the mess I'd made by throwing the plate across the room, but I couldn't make myself care about it. Blaze probably assumed I'd hop right out of bed and clean it up. I couldn't get over that he thought he'd be granting me this amazingly easy life if I'd just give up everything and become his personal servant. I'd fill my time with cleaning and cooking for him, but it would all be okay because he'd come home and fuck me at the end of the day. Sick as it was, my body still responded to that last thought. Sex with Blaze. I hadn't had enough. When he'd held me and kissed me, I'd forgotten everything else. I just wanted him. It was wrong, though. Blaze couldn't be farther from the right man for me. I had to get out of there. A whirlwind had descended on my life and tossed me into some alternate reality, where things made zero sense. Dragons existed, and some of them were misogynistic asshats. I shouldn't have been surprised. 
Men were men anywhere, right? Apparently even across worlds. I couldn't get over the look on his face when he'd explained that I could just cook and clean for him for the rest of my life. Forever. He'd look so proud of himself, like he was the best man ever for allowing me to clean up his mess. Not to mention the fact that his place was a pigsty. A fresh round of fury scorched out the sorrow that I was simultaneously feeling. It was like there was a separate being in me that didn't care how Blaze treated me as long as he came back and we were together. That big, dumb part of me. He hadn't treated me poorly, that part of me shouted. While that was true, allowing myself to make excuses like that for him was dangerous. For all I knew, I could end up like my mother. I needed to go home where I could think everything through the way I needed to. I hurt all over, and it was hard to think around Blaze. Besides, there was a whole other conversation taking place in the back of my mind about who'd poured gasoline all over my hut. As I cooled down, I regretted throwing a plate at Blaze. I was a mess. I needed space to think and make sense. I'm sorry. I jolted. Blaze wasn't in the room, but I'd clearly heard his voice in my head. Blaze? My voice shook. Horrified, I jerked around to see if he was hiding somewhere. This isn't funny. He wasn't there, though. I was hearing him in my head. More of his thoughts were bouncing around, but I did everything I could to shut them out. I didn't want to go there right then. I fought to get to my feet and tried to limp across the room. The skin on the bottom of my foot tugged, and I forced myself to fight through the pain. It was one thing to ignore Blaze when he said that we were mates, but having his thoughts pushed into my head, I couldn't ignore that. I couldn't pretend the signs weren't there. The faster I could get away, the faster I could get back to ignoring him and put the reality of our situation in perspective. Maybe there was a way out of it. Surely you weren't just stuck with your mate just because you had a bite mark on your neck. Free will and all of that. I wasn't going to spend my life with a man who was so domineering and controlling. I couldn't. That had been my mother's downfall. It was the reason that my sister and I had to grow up in foster care, being shuffled from one place to another, and never really belonging to anyone. I would not be blinded by stupid feelings and amazing sex. I was smarter than that. Before I reached the door, it opened. Blaze spotted me hobbling around and rushed toward me. I should have flinched. If I was so worried about him being domineering and controlling, why did my body relax? Was I so messed up? He scooped me into his arms and hurried into the bathroom. You are bleeding, mate. Don't call me that. My voice was sharp much more forceful than I intended. He lowered me onto the side of the tub and closed his eyes for a second. I need to take care of your foot. Can you not throw anything at me? I looked down and got a little lightheaded at the sight of the fresh blood that had already tainted the white marble tub. Shit. Please do not fight me right now, China. You will hurt yourself. Did I hit a vein? Why is there so much blood? I swayed. Oh, God, there's more. Blaze gruffly chuckled. You are okay. Cherry brought an ointment from the pharmacy to put on it. It will help it remain germ-free and heal faster. An antibiotic. Good. You must lay down and allow it to heal. His voice dipped. We can argue about whatever you want to argue about later. For now, please allow yourself to heal and allow me to care for you. Please. Even in my nauseated state, I could tell that Blaze wasn't used to begging. He had humbled himself for me. Feeling weaker and like that huge dummy part of me was growing stronger, I nodded. Fine, but it doesn't mean anything. Blaze brushed my hair out of my face 
and tenderly touched his lips to the top of my head. It means everything to me. I closed my eyes. I told myself it was so I wouldn't have to see any more blood. But I think it was more of an attempt to close off some of the connection I was feeling with Blaze. He had a heavy look on his face, and something behind those oddly colored eyes hinted that he wanted more than just a maid. I didn't want to see it. His thoughts were too strong. They invaded my head even though I'm not sure he even wanted them to. I should have kept her here. She would not have suffered injuries had I been a better mate. This is my fault. What kind of male allows an injury like this to happen to his female? I squeezed my eyes shut more tightly and tried harder to block his thoughts. I needed to keep a wall between us, a wall of anger and distance. So as soon as I was feeling a little better, I could get the hell out of there and not look back. I wasn't about to spend my life acting as a housewife, but I had a feeling that if I got to know Blaze better, I might end up making too many compromises in that direction. It was probably in my blood. I'm gonna bandage your foot again and then run you an oatmeal bath. It helped your skin last night. I will finish washing your hair, too. Pass. China. It's okay, Blaze. I just want to get back in bed. Fine. For now. I held my breath as he doctored my foot, his hands gentle against my skin. He held my ankle like it was made of porcelain. When his palms cupped my calves, my body reacted like he'd stroked my girly parts. My libido was out of control. If Blaze noticed, though, he said nothing. That was one blessing in an otherwise hellish situation. Okay. His voice was sandpaper as he stood and lifted me easily into his arms. Bed for you, unless you would like me to carry you to the couch to watch TV or something. Bed, please. We could both be polite. I will tuck you in bed and then prepare you more breakfast. I wanted to apologize for throwing the first breakfast he'd made me at his head, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. Instead, I remained quiet and let him place me on the bed. As soon as he released me, I moved away and pretended to be focused on adjusting the blankets over my legs. I am not a chef. I will try my best. How have you not starved to death without a maid around to cook your meals? Catching my snark, Blaze simply stared at me for a few moments before shaking his head and leaving me alone. I let my head fall back against the pillows. They smelled like him. Sigh. Chapter 13, Blaze. Remy was waiting outside to talk to me. He'd arrived at his own unhurried pace and no rush to console me. He had no sympathy for me since I was the one with a female and he was, as of yet, unmated. I'd already fed my queen and she was sleeping again, or at least pretending to sleep. She did not want to talk to me, but I wasn't about to press her at the moment. Brother! He looked me over and scowled. Why do you look worse than before you had a mate? I sighed. It is more difficult than I thought it would be. She does not want to be my mate. She does not understand that it is not a choice. She will not even give us a chance. She just wants to leave. Remy frowned. Have you tried explaining everything to her? I nodded, then hesitated. I think I have. I don't know. I get so angry and frustrated when she insists on leaving. Does she not feel the mate pull? He sat down in one of my chairs and rubbed his temples. That is how it works, right? Even with humans? They feel the pull just like we do. Isn't that what Beast and Cesar said? I sat across from him and shrugged. I don't know. I was not listening to them. I was too busy thinking about both of us slowly going insane and having to be put down like rabid animals. I was not paying much attention either. We both sat in silence, 
each lost in our own thoughts. When I finally looked up at my twin, I found him frowning again. What? We did not have a good example of how to behave as mates. I squirmed uncomfortably. Remy and I didn't normally talk about our parents. The turn in conversation suddenly made me feel about as comfortable as if I was sitting on a cactus. I don't know. Yes, you do. We both know. Father was not a good mate. Remy sighed deeply and stretched his legs out in front of him before crossing them at the ankles. I do not think we should model our relationships with our mates after our mother and fathers. Father was not a good male. He met my eyes. I also do not think mother was his real mate. What? It's something I've thought about for a long time. I've seen how Beast and Cesar treat their mates. They would never hurt them. He held his palms out to me, face up. I cannot say for sure, brother. I have no proof. It's just, he was so cruel to her. I stood up and paced behind my chair for a few minutes. Then, gripping the back of it, I tried to take an objective look at our younger centuries from my now mature viewpoint. I could not do it, though. Mother must have been father's mate. Why else would she have given up her life to be with him? It does not matter, really. It was not as though either of us thought that father's behavior toward her was an appropriate way to treat one's mate, right? The way he phrased it as a question pissed me off. What in fire's sake do you think? I'm just, you are not forcing her to stay against your will, are you? My face flushed with fury, both at him and myself. Get off my land. Remy lightly grinned. Of course you aren't. You are not our father. Feeling as though he'd dealt a physical blow to my chest, I stumbled backward. I was not holding her against her will. Not really. It was for her own good. I was attempting to care for her, perhaps against her will. With Remy's parting remark, my stomach soured and I wondered if I was more like our father than Remy was. More like him than I'd ever realized. I would never lay a hand on China in a harmful way, not ever. But there were ways of harming someone other than physical blows. Mental torment was just as bad sometimes. Where was the line? Heading back inside, I passed my bedroom door and listened to her shallow, even breathing. She was finally sleeping. I slipped inside and stood next to the bed, watching her chest rise and fall. I tried to imagine sending her away, but I couldn't do it. I could not let her go. It had nothing to do with wanting to control her or with anything father had done to mother. It was purely because I felt as though I'd die if she wasn't close by. As though I'd cease to exist. I needed to be able to make sure she was safe. I needed to be able to touch her to reassure myself that she was okay. I didn't know much about her, only that she was my queen, and that she had a feisty nature, even up against a dragon. I needed time to learn her, to know how to please her. Maybe then she would want to stay. I just needed a little more time. I could not let her go yet. That probably made me more like father than I cared to admit but I would learn as much about her as quickly as possible, then do whatever it took to make her happy. China whimpered in her sleep, and my heart skipped a beat. How could I leave her alone when she might be plagued by nightmares? I eased into bed behind her and pulled her onto my chest. She curled up and sighed happily. Even a sleeper body knew that I was hers if she'd just listened to her body. She'd know that we were meant to be. Remy's words came back to me as I relaxed under China. I couldn't stop thinking about our parents and their relationship, 
or the relationships in our kingdom in general. Women were seen as inferior purely on the basis of their physical strength. They stayed close to home and maintained the household. They had been fine with it, or so I'd thought. My mother had been fine with it, hadn't she? They'd all been fine with the males being in charge. Our kingdom had been scorned and mocked by some, though. While the role of females in most of the kingdoms around us had progressed, my father very strictly forbade such a change in ours. Remy and I had questioned very little when we took over. This new world was very different from any of the kingdoms in the old world. My words, my thinking, had seemed to greatly offend China. I had much to think about, and even more to figure out. While China napped, I racked my brain trying to determine my next course of action. I wanted to do the correct thing for my queen. I wanted to please her, even if what she wanted did not please me. Chapter 14, China. When I awoke, Blaze was nowhere in sight, and there was a plate of food on the chair next to the bed. I sat up, feeling better than I had that morning, and grabbed the plate. I was starving. The sandwich and chips were much better than the runny eggs and burnt toast Blaze had brought me earlier. But who could mess up a sandwich? I felt even better after eating and scooted higher up on the bed to rest my back against the headboard. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't get up and walk around without risking opening my foot back up. I was trapped in Blaze's bed, a bed I'd just spent one of the best nights of my life in a few nights earlier. The sheets smelled like him. Spicy, masculine, warm, and comforting. If I was being completely honest, I did want him nearby. What I didn't want was to give up my independence. A relationship, by definition, would force me to do that, wouldn't it? I'd have to compromise, have someone keep tabs on me, answer to another person, make sacrifices. Yet, here I still was, Leave it to me to have a one-night stand that never ended. As though thinking about him had conjured him up, Blaze walked into the room, fresh from a shower. The towel wrapped around his waist, slung low on his hips, did nothing to hide the bulge he sported. His hair was wet, and droplets of water ran down his chest and abs to meet at the top of that towel. Torture. Pure agony. My body wanted him, no doubt about that. But it would seem that, in other ways, he and I were completely incompatible. He seemed stuck in a mindset that hadn't been popular in almost a hundred years. Hey, he wanted a maid, I reminded myself. He wanted to control me and keep me like a possession, I reminded myself. The huge dummy in me didn't care, though. It reacted with a wild force, even stronger than when I'd first seen him. China. Lay stepped toward me, his expression strained. Stop looking at me that way. I blinked and felt my face flush. I'm feeling much better. I will dress and then I will help you bathe. Cherry and Cesar are coming over later. He walked over to the stacks of new clothes and took a t-shirt off the top of one of the stacks and a pair of jeans off another before stepping back into the bathroom, presumably to dress. Since you're feeling better, they will take you home. My heart sank. I suddenly felt sick to my stomach and had to bite my lip to stop tears from forming. It made zero sense, but I wanted to cry and demand an explanation. A minute passed, and then Blaze came out, dressed in the brand new clothes. His feet were still bare as he walked across to me. I wasn't completely sure, but I thought I could hear, maybe feel, a thought. It didn't make any sense, though. She is free. 
I am not my father. I will carry you to the tub and you can do the rest. You'll feel better when you are clean. What changed? Changed? Yeah, this whole time you've been like, stay, stay, don't leave. And now you're all set to get rid of me? What gives? I am not set to get rid of you, but I would like you to want to be here. He ran his fingers through his hair and scowled. I am not a demon. I'll never want to be your maid, Blaze, or your little housewife. That's not, it's not for me. I forced myself to hold his gaze and ignore the huge dummy inside that wanted him to beg me to stay. I'm not interested in being controlled. I am not controlling. Blaze's raised voice showed his frustration. I am not controlling. I am just conditioned to think of things in a certain way. You cannot boss me around. For fire's sake, China. I'm letting you go. What more do you want? You're letting me go? There you go again. I could feel the frustration rolling off him. Flexing his hands at his sides, he glared at me. I do not want you to leave. I am trying to give you what you want. By that time, I'd gotten control of myself again, and my guard was back up. My conviction to get away was restored. Shaking my head, I averted my eyes. You and I will never work. He came toward me, his anger and frustration still seemingly tangible. But I wasn't afraid of him. Like I weighed nothing, he scooped me up and carried me toward the bathroom. I did not want this either. I did not walk into that bar expecting that I was going to find my mate. I was perfectly contented with my life. Were you just looking to find someone to fuck? Why I cared why I was asking was beyond me. His eyes narrowed. And if I was? I jerked my head toward him, a sour taste in the back of my throat. What could I say to that? Not a whole hell of a lot. Then we would have both been there for the same reason. You were there? Yes. Yes, I was. I was looking to get laid. Just looking for someone, anyone to fuck. I was sick and tired of being a virgin. In fact, until you walked in and got in my face, your buddy Armand was on the fast track to getting lucky. I wanted to hurt Blaze for some reason, probably because picking a fight made it easier for me to follow through on leaving. I watched as the dragon flashed across Blaze's face. His eyes burned bright reddish gold, and his skin became a dark shade of crimson with golden veins threaded through it. He held me tighter, closer to his body, but his grip was still careful. Do not say that to me. The low growl was a warning for me to stop toying with him. I couldn't stop myself, though. If Armand would have just been a little quicker, he and I would have been long gone and bumping uglies by the time you arrived. He would have been my first instead of you. Blaze put me down in the bathtub and let out a sound that seemed to be a combination of growl and roar. You are mine. If you desire for me to prove it to you, for me to... Fight to win you, I will. I will challenge any dragon for the right to claim you. I'll chain you to my bed if I flaming have to. His fists opened slightly to accommodate the huge claws that were extending from his fingertips. A sick satisfaction purred inside me. Anger and arousal swirled, and I climbed to my feet, careful to stand on my good foot. You don't own me. You're just the one night stand that never ended. He laughed wickedly. Yet your body is aching for me, mate. I can smell you. Is it what I said about being chained to my bed? You want that, don't you? Perhaps your truest desire is to serve me. I slapped him. It was like someone else had possessed me. As soon as my hand landed on his cheek, I gasped and snapped out of my fury-fueled rage. Oh, God. Oh, no. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean. I'm sorry, Blaze. His back was as stiff as a tree trunk as he jerked away from me and stormed out of the bedroom. 
I sank into the tub and held my face in my hands as I cried. I couldn't believe I'd struck him. I couldn't believe I'd said the things I'd said. What was happening to me? I wanted to run after him and apologize. To top it off, his feelings were clearly projected to me, and I could feel his pain as he left. It was as strong as my own, maybe stronger. He was hurting, and it was my fault. I'd picked a fight because I was a coward. The worst thing, the absolute worst thing, was that above his pain, what he really wanted most was to come back and make sure I was okay. He was still worried about me, even after I'd assaulted him. I was such an incredible bitch. He was doing everything he could to make me comfortable and care for me, including sending me home because I demanded it. If I could only have retreated to my ignorance so I could still be angry with him and sorry for myself. It would be easier that way because then I'd be able to walk away blissfully ignorant of how much I was hurting him. And I did have to walk away, now more than ever. It was obvious. A woman like me was far too broken. Chapter 15, Blaze. When Cherry and Cesar came to get China, not a word was spoken. They could feel the tension, I was sure. It was so thick it was hard to breathe in my own castle. My mate left, but the feelings that had blown up between us still snaked around me, taunting me. I'd lost control of my temper. I'd gotten angry and raised my voice to her, like my father did to my mother. I had not struck her as my father would have done, but I could hardly claim that as a victory. Every well-meaning plan I'd constructed in my head had blown up and flown off. I'd meant to convince her to talk to me, and get to know me, to show me what she expected from a relationship. I wanted to be a good mate for her. I wanted that so much. I sank into one of the chairs outside on the dock with a flagon of Armand's special brew and chugged a hefty amount, hoping to numb the pain. I needed to mend the gaping hole in my heart. How pathetic is a dragon imbibing while waxing poetic to himself about his own aching heart, brother. I called out randomly to Remy. Coming. I didn't wait for him to arrive before upending the flask of spirits and finishing it. I wasn't in the mood to share. Not when I'd preferred to drink myself unconscious or dead. I'd lost my queen. She had not even looked back at me when she left. She had kept her head down and had been so closed off. I tried to invade her head to get a glimpse of what she was feeling, but there was nothing there for me. She was guarded, cold. She must hate me. I wasn't sure how much time had passed before Remy landed on my dock and then strode up to me. I pointed him inside for clothes, and when he came back out, he was dressed in a pair of my jeans. You might run a vacuum around the place once in a while, bro. What happened? I would like to know that myself. You don't know what happened. I let my head fall back and stared up at the sky. How had it become night already? The stars were out and bright, unobscured by city lights like some places in the New World were. Do you ever miss the old kingdom, brother? Remy snorted. <laughs> Is that a joke? Do I miss the place where we ruled over our kingdom as the most powerful dragons in all the land and all respected and feared us? Where our very names spoken aloud conjured up visions of such power and might that our subjects were left trembling? The place where commoners prostrated themselves at the mere sight of us. I grunted. China does not want to clean. Okay. No big deal, right? I looked over at him. It is a big deal, apparently. 
I tried to explain to her what mates are and how the female is in charge of the home and birthing younglings. No, wait, I did not even have a chance to mention younglings. The conversation never got past caring for our home. You're not making any sense. She said she will not wipe my ass, as though I would ask her to do such a thing, never. I tossed the empty flagon away from me and grinned when I heard it smashed to the ground. The disrespect she has for me. She cares nothing for me at all. She does not want to be mated to me. She does not want to be my queen. Because she does not want to clean? I suppose. I don't know. Maybe she just doesn't like me. Remy blew out a heavy breath and sank further into his seat. Well, what did she say? Her exact words, bro. I... I racked my brain. What had she said? She said something... Weren't you listening? Well, of course I was listening. I stood up and stumbled away from him. She said she did not want me. Because of the housework. Why do you keep talking about housework? To show how stupid you sound? I charged at him and knocked him backward. The chair broke under us and I'd let another broken thing in my life fuel me on, even if it was just furniture. I punched him in the face and then he was somehow on top of me, throwing his own jab at my chin. My movements were slow and hindered by Armand's brew. It was easy for Remy to get a couple more good shots in before hoisting himself up and walking away. You are a fool. You have a mate. Why are you fighting about birthing younglings and doing housework? If she does not want to cook or clean, then she will not cook and clean. What's the big deal? What are you talking about? We were just talking about how amazing the old world was. Women took care of us. Our mate should want to take care of us. Flaming scales, Blaze. Of course the old world was nice. We were younglings, and then we were royalty. Males who were catered to as younglings are. Having everything done for you is a privilege. But our life is here now. Females here. Human females are not the same as dragonesses of the old world were. They work. They take care of their families. And we are no longer kings. You really cannot get over the change. I did not want anything to change. None of us asked to be here. The old world crumbled, brother. We flexed our power too much and turned some against us. We were being hunted and slaughtered one by one. Do you think living like that is better than having a mate who will not wipe your ass? I do not want my ass wiped. For the last flaming time, I will wipe my own ass. Well, fortunately, the toilet paper here is so much better than what we used in the old world. I held my composure for a second and then laughed. You are an idiot. You are the real idiot. You do not need a mate to clean up after you and feed you like you are some overgrown youngling. You are a warrior dragon. Care for yourself, brother. I can do that. Maybe. I just thought. I assumed that if I found a mate, it would be like the old world. A little bit. I look back up at the sky. I do miss it sometimes. The power and the freedom. Don't we all, brother? What if that is not the real reason why she does not want to stay with me? The thought had been there, niggling me for a while. What if she could see the evil that had been bred into me? What if she could see into my soul and did not like what she saw? And who would? The dragon who had sired me, my father, had been called the Demon King. Perhaps she could see a sign of that in me. And that sign told her to run. Your cock is not as big as mine, 
but I am sure she'll grow used to it, Blaze. Remy shrugged, fighting a grin. I scowled. Leave. Yeah, yeah, I'm going, puny penis. Enough of that. Why? What are you gonna do about it, teeny weeny? I dragged myself to my feet and shifted. I am going to kick your ass. He shifted and took to the sky. That'll be the day, dinky dick. Remy knew what he was doing. Fighting with him took my mind off my mate for a few minutes. Unfortunately, it left another gaping hole in my castle wall that no one but me was going to clean up. Chapter 16, China. I'm not leaving you here alone, China. Cherry stood over me with her hands on her hips. Damned if everyone wasn't trying to boss me around. She and Cesar had insisted on staying the night with me, but the next morning I was feeling much better. I'm not listening to you and Cesar go at it like a couple of horny toads for another night. Thanks, but no thanks. I'm not comfortable with this. Someone tried to hurt you. It could have been intentional. Cherry blinked away tears and shook her head when she saw me start to object. No, don't say it. It wasn't an accident. If someone didn't pour gasoline all over that little hut you were going into, how did it get there? I stared up at the ceiling and reminded myself that she was my sister and I loved her. Cherry, no one could have known that I'd go in there and drop a lit match. Hell, I haven't even lit that lantern for months. If that was a murder attempt, it was a pretty damn feeble one if you ask me. Don't say murder. Groaning, I shook my head at her. You're being a little overly dramatic again. I shot Cesar a pleading look, and he stepped forward and wrapped his arm gently around Cherry. I think it's time we go, mate. China will be okay. Cherry looked like she wanted to argue with him, but then a faraway look came over her face and she nodded. Okay. What? What was that? Did you deliver some dragon form of Xanax to her? Cherry narrowed her eyes at me. You're lucky I love you. We'll leave you to your own devices tonight, but not until after I've cooked you something and done the sheets in your guest room. You don't, I stopped myself. Actually, yeah, do the sheets. She giggled as she passed by her maid and trailed her hand over his chest. Come help me, big dragon. Come on, guys. If I have to hear you two fooling around one more time, I'm going to hobble out into the swamp and pray that something does kill me. All right, all right. Cesar held up his hands. I will do the sheets and Cherry can cook you something. I'll do the sheets. Your cooking is better. Cherry rubbed her belly. And I always add too much salt to everything. It's making my ankles swell. I reached out for her stomach and blinked back tears when she moved closer so I could rub a spot over my future niece or nephew. I love this little dragon eaglet, but I'm tired of your salty cooking too, Cher. Cesar laughed and nodded. Thank God I learned to cook. Cesar busied himself in the kitchen while Cherry disappeared down the hallway to take care of the bedding. I stayed quiet for a bit, thinking about Cesar cooking. Why did you learn to cook? He looked up from rummaging through the fridge. I was hungry? I guess Blaze never got hungry enough. I said it lightly, not meaning to insult his friend. I wasn't sure I wanted to open a can of worms right then either. I'd been doing everything I could to stop thinking about him. Wasn't working. Ah, your question is not about cooking, is it? No, it is. I busied myself pulling my hair up into a ponytail. I was just curious. Sure. Cesar grabbed a pot from the pot rack over the island and looked up at me. A little history lesson. I maneuvered on the stool so I could face him more. Yeah. In our old world, the place from where we came, we each belonged to different kingdoms. There were many, a bit like this world with its countries. Each kingdom was, 
is unique. My kingdom and most other kingdoms had progressed and made changes with time. Dragons live long, long lives. But our species is not all that different from your kind. With each new generation, some of the older beliefs got modernized. None of the kingdoms had reached where this world is currently. Not before we left, anyway. But many kingdoms were on their way. One kingdom, however, was run for many years by an evil, brutish king, a sadist. He was much feared and was dubbed the Demon King. His kingdom, his subjects, did not progress, mostly because he forbade change or growth. The Demon King preferred to rule through tyranny and oppression, and his younglings were groomed by him to rule in a similar manner. They were taught his brutal ways, yet they did not possess the dark heart of cruelty the way their father did. He looked at me pointedly. Blaze? And his twin, Remy. Cesar sighed. They came to this world still very much believing in those old ways. They've grown and changed much, perhaps as much as they can, without a reason to change more, that is. History lesson over. I didn't want to hear that he thought I could give Blaze that reason to change. I didn't want to hear anything else to make me hate myself more for leaving his house and him. Blaze is rough around the edges, China, but I have known him for many years, and I am certain he is a good male. I believe he would do anything he needed to do to please his true mate. What are you making? I hobbled over to the recliner in front of the TV and plopped into it fiddling with the remote. Spaghetti, a lovely dish that did not exist in our old world. No spaghetti? What a shithole. Cesar laughed out loud, like I'd hoped he would, dissipating the tension. You are humorous. But I'm funnier, right? Cherry winked at me while walking up behind Cesar and slapping him on the butt. She trailed the scent of laundry detergent. Of course, mate. I was just telling your sister about some of the ways the old world was lacking, in some kingdoms more than others. Cesar kissed my sister and smiled lovingly as they locked eyes. And the worst part of all was that it lacked the amazing, breathtaking beauty of my mate. I fake gagged, but Cherry preened. Her smile was so radiant it was almost too bright to look at. She wrapped her arms around him and sighed. How did I get so lucky? Tears burned the backs of my eyes as I stared a hole into the TV, desperate to blot out the happy love fest going on in the kitchen. I wished they would leave already so I could be alone. I needed time to lick my wounds in private and think about all that had happened. In such a short period of time, a matter of days, my whole world had upended itself, and I wasn't sure I'd ever be the same. China, you okay? I put the recliner foot down and stood up. I'd taken to using a crutch to keep the pressure off my bad foot. I grabbed it quickly. Um, yeah, I'm good. I just need to go to the bathroom. I knew that by the end of my pathetic sentence, they could tell I was having trouble holding back the floodgate of tears, but they didn't follow me. Cesar made sure to keep Cherry at his side so I could have a few minutes to myself. And for that, I was grateful. I shut myself into my room and sat at the edge of my bed trying to get it together. I was beginning to realize that things would never go back to the way they were pre-Blaze. Old China was gone. She'd wanted to jumpstart her life like cherries, and it had started all right, with a momentum all its own. Chapter 17, China A week had passed, a very slow week, and my foot was almost as good as new. It felt good enough to bear weight finally, and I could wear a normal shoe. I'd started getting back out to my little projects even. I hadn't yet braved the remains of the hut farthest from my house, though. That place could wait until I didn't get the chills every time I thought of it. Despite my body healing and feeling better, 
Emotionally, I was having a tough time. It was overly apparent that feelings didn't heal at the same rate as cuts. I thought about Blaze constantly. If there was ever a moment when he wasn't on my mind, it was like my body had physical withdrawals. I'd become testy and impatient with everyone around me. Cherry had decided to stay away from me until I got it figured out, she'd told me. Other friends who'd shown up to check on me had just stopped coming around. Visits had become phone calls, and then silence. I was fine with it. If they thought my mood was sour, they hadn't even scratched the surface. I decided enough was enough. I was going back to blazes. I needed to, to talk. I told myself it was to talk, but I was craving him like a fiend. Waiting a week had been my aim. I told myself that if I could resist for a week, maybe the cravings would fade, even just a bit. That hadn't happened, though. If anything, they were stronger. Some moments, it was like I could feel his desire, too. When Cherry called me, she caught me climbing into my boat. She actually cheered. You're going to him, aren't you? I wanted to deny it, but I couldn't get the words past my lips. I need to talk to him. Finally. You were becoming a lunatic, and Cesar says that Blaze is a mess without you. Strange how that perked my ears right up. What? Oh, yeah. He's been drinking gallons of Armand's brew. When he isn't watching over you, of course. She let out a little gasp. I did not say that. I froze, my hand on the rope, ready to untie the dock line. I'm gonna need you to repeat that. Oh, what the hell. You're headed to his place, so I guess you are bound to find out anyway. Besides, he deserves credit for what he's been doing. We were all worried about you. None of us more than Blaze, though. You know, after he found you in that fire and rescued you, he never left your side. Not for a second. He cleaned all the mud off you, inspected you for injuries, bandaged your foot, tucked you in bed. Cherry! She jumped when I screamed, and her hands flew in the air. Okay. Well, he still hasn't left. He's been watching over your house and you. He wanted to make sure you were safe despite you rejecting him. I didn't. I was about to deny that I'd rejected him, but technically that is what it amounted to. I had rejected him. Admitting it left a bad taste in my mouth for some reason. A shame that weighed heavily on me. So, he's just been watching my house? Not in a creepy way. Cherry was fast to defend Blaze. She didn't need to, though. The revelation did little to calm my already raging hormones. I felt like I was in heat, my skin almost as sensitive as it had been after the fire. I was desperate. China? Call you later. I tossed my phone in my bag and pushed the boat off the dock starting the engine as I drifted away from land. I sped toward the bay that fed off the mainland and would get me to blazes faster. I was feeling reckless. The closer I got to his house, the more the heaviness on my chest seemed to lift and lighten. For the first time in over a week, I could breathe easy. Reminding myself that it wasn't permanent didn't faze me. I couldn't think past the here and now. I was going to see Blaze and talk. Talk. I tied my boat off at his dock and rushed up to his door. There was a mess on his patio, chairs knocked over, broken glass, and it looked like new damage to a wall. I raised my hand to knock, but before my fist made contact with the door, I felt someone behind me. Turning, I watched as the great crimson dragon landed and shifted back to his human form. Blaze, all his male nakedness before me, sent jolts of heat through me, as though someone had hooked a power cord to my body. 
I buzzed with energy and excitement. Blaze walked swiftly toward me, his strides eating up the ground between us. He was already hard, and at that moment, neither of us pretended that I'd come for anything else. Raw desire radiated from both of us. When he got close, I launched myself into his arms, and he caught me in midair, holding me tight as I wrapped my legs around his waist. My lips found his, and for the first time in days, all was right with the world. He and I together in a lover's embrace. It was as though nothing else mattered. Before I knew it, I was naked, and Blaze was inside of me, moving hard and fast. We both climaxed fast, standing on his patio amidst the mess. The experience was rough and needy, a far cry from the first time we'd been together. It was just what the doctor ordered, though. I felt like I could think again. On top of Blaze, his shaft still hard inside of me, I felt like myself again. His scent filled my nostrils, and I had the thought that I could stay there forever. Forever, spent in the embrace of a man I barely knew. A man with a father so cruel and tyrannical, he'd been dubbed the Demon King. A man who, Cesar had said, began his short reign the same way his father had. Minus the cruelty, but with the same oppressiveness. Blaze growled. I can feel you thinking. I don't hear your thoughts, but I can sense they are not good. Please stop. Stay. I wanted to. I couldn't, though. Without the blindingly needy libido, I could process what I was doing in a more sane and rational way. I was leading Blaze on, making him think that I'd changed my mind about his mate thingy. I gotta go. He rolled his head back, looking at the sky and groaned. China. I slipped off him, disengaging and disappointing. I'm sorry I came back here, Blaze. I shouldn't have. Why did you? Staring up at him, I shuddered. Apparently my neediness had not been completely sated. Sure, the quickie had taken the edge off, but I still desired him. Badly. You know why. So we can have sex, but not have a relationship. Would that be okay? I wanted to slap myself as soon as the words were out of my mouth. Forget I said that. You do not want to be my mate or spend time to get to know me, but you want to have sex with me? He sat in one of the lawn chairs, his rippled abs tightening as he did. He also didn't bother covering his naked sex. Instead, he stared at me like I was a puzzle to solve. After a few uncomfortable seconds, he scratched his head and shrugged. Fine. A part of me cheered. The idea of getting to have no string sex with Blaze was beyond thrilling. Another, probably larger part of me, felt self-sabotaging. I ignored that last part, though. Just sex. No relationship commitments. No chance of being controlled or manipulated. Blaze looked out of the water beyond his yard and rested his elbows on his knees. It must be this way, right? If I'd been a better person, I would have acted like I hadn't said anything. Hearing the disappointment in his voice, I wanted to take it all back and end things for good. I knew that wouldn't last for long, though. It had been hell staying away from him for the week. Any self-control I'd ever had was a joke when it came to Blaze. It's just... All I have to offer right now. My door is always open for you. With a final frown at me, Blaze stood, dusted his bare ass off, and walked into his house, giving me a beautiful view of his tight derriere and stiff back. I knew he wasn't happy with me. His feelings were clearly transmitted. Frustration, disappointment, and hurt. 
but if I blocked them, I could almost convince myself that I was doing the right thing. Didn't men want uncomplicated sex? Wasn't that a dream come true for guys? Heading back to my boat, I forced myself to ignore what Cherry had called the mate pull. Like a mantra, I repeated, just keep moving. Chapter 18, Blaze. Lucinda Taylor. Here. Blaze Dragon. Here. Wonderful. We're all present and accounted for. Welcome to Simple to Fix Foods 101. For those of you who are new to Lafouche Community Center, welcome. I'm your instructor, Mrs. Fontenot. Mrs. Fontenot was a round-faced, blue-haired, older female. She seemed pleasant enough with apple cheeks and a wide smile. With Cherry's help, I decided to take a class to learn to cook. I was hoping it would help prove to China my worthiness as a mate. There were five other students enrolled beside myself. Since all of you have signed the safety procedures forms, let's all make our way over to the hot plates and cooking supplies set up. Mrs. Fontenot gestured to the back of the room. I want to be next to the bodybuilder. As I noticed the slender blonde female who had spoken, she winked. I looked over my shoulder to see if she was talking to someone behind me, but when I saw no one was there, I realized she must have been talking to me. I ignored her. After spending about five minutes explaining the procedures and instructions for making pancakes, the blue-haired Mrs. Fontenot told us to begin. I was feeling confident. No more runny eggs and burnt toast for my mate. I would make her the most delicious breakfast ever. If only I could convince her to stay until morning. So, big guy, what brings you to cooking class? It was the slender blonde, and she was leaning a little too close for me. I am learning to cook for my ma my girlfriend. She clucked her tongue and pouted. Darn, all of the good ones are taken. The male next to me elbowed me and whispered loudly. Dude, I am single. Trade places with me. I was more than happy to comply. As soon as I did, he began a running dialogue aimed at the blonde. So, my name is George. I work in retail. I take these classes once in a while as a way to meet new and interesting people. I have to say, you're one of the most interesting people I've met in a long time. Do you live around here? I winced. It would seem George was not very smooth with the females. I concentrated on mixing my ingredients. I poured some oil into the pan and waited for it to heat. This was not so difficult. It now seemed silly that I had never attempted to cook before. For over 80 years, I'd been eating prepared food and takeout. I was eager to surprise my mate with a delicious meal. As I poured my batter into the hot pan, I kept one eye on George. He seemed to know what he was doing and I suspected it wasn't his first time taking a cooking class. If George could make a pancake, I could. I watched as George held the pan up off the hot plate. Watch this. He flicked his wrist so that, amazingly, the pancake flew up, flipped in midair, and came back down in the pan. Wow, that was awesome. The blonde's eyes widened. Hmm. Huh. George's trick impressed the female. I could do that. If a puny human like George could flip a pancake, I could. I was smart about it, too. Using my spatula, I made sure my pancake was loosened around the edges. Then, with a flick of the wrist, I flipped the pancake into the air. I did a wonderful job. I flipped mine twice as high as George had. I grinned with pride. I liked cooking. I even received a chorus of oohs and ahs from the other students, murmurs of awe and admiration. Or so I thought. Until I realized that my pancake did not return to its pan. 
I looked around for it only to find Mrs. Fontenot standing in front of me with her hands on her hips, jaw hanging open, and pancake batter dripping down her forehead. She was wearing my pancake like a hat. Just as the gravity of the situation kicked in, I smelled something burning. I froze. I wasn't sure what I should do in the situation. Should I clean her? Yes, I should probably remove the pancake from her blue-gray hair. As I leaned over, the burning smell was stronger this time. Someone was seriously scorching their pancake. Only when the smoke curls wafted in front of my eyes did I notice that somebody was me. My apron was on fire. It was not the end of the world. I could put out a fire and I would heal within minutes from any burns incurred. I patted the growing flames, effectively extinguishing them. All would have been well if the small fire had not triggered the sprinkler system. There were screams and shouts as the sprinklers ruined all the pancakes and drenched my classmates. Mrs. Fontenot, dripping wet and wiping soggy pancake from her face, just glared at me as she pointed to the door. I was later than I meant to be. After I was expelled from cooking class, I'd spent a little while flying around, trying to calm myself. China was waiting for me. I could feel her. She'd visited every other night for the first week, then every night for the past week. She never stayed. She never let me fly her home. She never knew that I flew above her every night, watching over her, ensuring she made it safely home. She could just let herself in, but I knew she wouldn't. It was somehow crossing one of her boundaries in this game we were playing. The darkness I'd been carrying around lifted slightly when I got closer to my home. I could scent that China was there. Brownies and vanilla cream icing. Seeing her in the evenings was the part of the day that I lived for. I wanted more than what China was giving me, but I did not know how to get it. She was like an impenetrable wall. No matter how much I hoffed or puffed or demanded, she wasn't budging. No sleepovers. No feelings, no cuddling. Just sex. If I held her too long, she pulled away, like it was a dirty mop against her skin. I did not understand. My dragon did not understand. Yet, there I was surrendering completely to playing by China's rules for a mere taste of her every day. Maybe it wouldn't have been so frustrating if it hadn't felt like she appreciated me at all. I landed and shifted. Instead of heading up to China naked like I normally would, I let myself in the side of the house and pulled on a pair of jeans before going out and sitting across from her in what was left of the patio chairs. I'd need to eventually replace the ones Remy and I had broken. Actually, looking around, I noticed for the first time how dirty the place was. I'd tried cooking and that had not worked well. Perhaps if I could learn to clean. Sitting next to China without touching her was painful, but I was feeling bitter. It had been a terrible day. I did not look at her. Where were you? Her usually husky voice was quiet. You're usually here when I get here. Just out? I sighed. How was your day? Were you with someone else? You smell like perfume. The anger in her voice soothed me, and I finally looked up at her. She was just as stunning as always. Her thick, black, curly hair hung loosely over her shoulder. There was anger in her eyes, but also hurt. That didn't soothe any part of me, even the hurt parts of my own. I was in town. She slumped in her chair and looked out over the water. Sounds like fun. You could come along. We could go together sometime. Blaze. I stood up and marched toward the house. Yes, I know, sex only. Well, come on. 
I'd hate to have to force you to talk to me. China followed me. What the hell is your problem? You know what my problem is. Fine. You want to talk? Let's talk. She stepped over a pile of ripped clothing I needed to toss. I'm not in a great mood. I don't know why I even came here. Because we are mates, and no matter how much you fight it, we need each other. You're breaking the rules, Blaze. And you're making all the rules. I scrubbed my hands down my face and stopped overthinking everything for a moment. Going with my gut, I thought about what I wanted to know. Why was your day shitty? I found out about my neighbor. I sank into my couch and sighed, expecting her to be disappointed with me for that, too. Yeah. I can't believe he was responsible for the gasoline. I should press charges. If he had had that big of a problem with my little shed on the back of his multiple acres of land, all he had to do was tell me to move it. He didn't have to try to burn it down. I growled. He almost killed you. I got the impression that you made him really regret that. More than he already did. She gave me a rueful smile. What happened? I followed the scent of the accelerants to his house, and we had a long talk about what he'd done. He lived only because he hadn't meant to hurt you. Blaze! I shrugged. What? It is the truth. Do you wish me to lie? If his intention had been to harm you in any way, I would have killed him. Probably not something you should say too loudly. Why? Do you think your puny jails could hold a dragon who did not want to be caged? I flexed my muscles. No chance. Her face closed off. There's something else. Did he try anything? I sat forward ready for her to give me the word. I'd be at her neighbor's shitty little house in minutes. No, no, it's, I got a job offer in Florida. I'll be gone for a couple of months. Chapter 19, China. If I expected Blaze to explode, I was thoroughly let down. He held my gaze for a minute and then stood up. Walking across to his kitchen, he grabbed a flask from the fridge and nodded to himself. Well, he laughed, but there was nothing he found funny I knew. Well, aren't you going to say anything? What would you like me to say, China? He sat back down on the couch and took a long drag from the flask. It was Armand's brew, the only thing that seemed to inebriate the dragons. What did I want him to say? Everything. I wanted him to fight with me, fight for me. I knew it made zero sense. The rules we were sticking to were mine, after all. I'd pushed him away and made him keep his distance, except to make love to me, have sex with me, whatever. The past two weeks had done nothing to make leaving his side easier. Blaze wasn't just an itch that needed scratching. I felt like he was more of a permanent situation that I had to figure out. Whatever the case, I wanted him to fight. Things had been docile for weeks. We'd had little snippets of irritations, but I'd kept him so far away that there wasn't much to fight about in the little time we spent together. That night, though, I was feeling volatile. I wanted to see him angry. I wanted to push him into showing emotion. Something about showing up to his house and him not being there had set me off. Then, the scent of the perfume on him made me irate in a way that I couldn't even begin to explain to myself. I'm glad I'm leaving. We both need some space. Blaze's hands turned into fists, but his face remained calm. If you are expecting me to be happy that you're leaving, you will be disappointed. You'll have more time on your hands. Maybe you could hire a real maid. I will be okay without it. Oh, yeah? 
Find another mate who's willing to clean up after you? As I said it, I was embarrassed by how nasty and petty I sounded. I didn't know what was wrong with me. It was like I'd become a different person since meeting Blaze in that bar. I was irritable and snarky more than anything, and I'd managed to run all my friends off, at least for the time being. I knew they'd come back when I was back to being myself, but I wasn't even sure I wanted them to come back. That was how not myself I felt. There is no finding another mate. There is only one mate for me. One queen. And she happens to be me. I scowled, unable to help myself. Your one true mate who is supposed to do all of your cleaning for you? I'm tired, China. I do not have it in me to fight with you tonight. What's wrong? Another thing I was unable to help. The idea of something being wrong with him upset me. It's nothing you want to hear. He tucked his lips into his mouth and then blew out a big breath. When do you leave? I, I hadn't accepted the job yet. No matter how much I told myself to just take it, there was something holding me back. Something huge, big as a dragon. I don't know. Well, I'm sure Cherry will be sad to see you go, especially with her getting closer and closer to having their youngling. I stood up and paced into his kitchen. What about you? What about me? Will you be sad to see me go? Blaze followed me and wrapped his hands around my waist. Sad? I am wondering how I will survive. I spun around on him and frowned. I'm being serious. He raised his eyebrows and held my gaze. Me too. This whole thing. I wanted to tell him I was sorry. I'd heard him more than once I knew. I could feel it. I could feel him fighting the urge to grab me and keep me there. This is a mess. Like the air had deflated out of him, Blaze slumped and forced a smile. I do not know what you want from me. Maybe I should go home. He shrugged. Whatever you want to do, China. I'm going to head out if you're leaving. Where are you going? Out. Back to another bar? Blaze gently took my wrist in his hand and pulled my palm to his lips. Pressing a kiss to my sensitive skin, he held it there for a second longer before letting go. I want you to be happy. I wanted to ask him what he meant, but he turned and hurried out of the house before I could make sense of his words and the feelings of sorrow rolling off him. I ran after him, but he was already flying away by the time I got outside. I watched him go, with my own sorrow growing in the pit of my stomach. I had to leave. I couldn't keep torturing Blaze or myself. Taking the job in Florida would mean that I got to slip away from it all. I'd get some space and surely some closure. Time away from him would make it easier for both of us. I didn't know how I'd do it. Seeing Blaze every day had been the only way I'd kept myself sane. What I was feeling for him wasn't normal, though. I couldn't lose myself over some man. I refused to make the same mistake that I'd seen so many other women make. I'd been in the foster care system with so many kids whose mothers had made the same mistake. My own mother was one of them. No matter how right it felt to be with Blaze, I couldn't fall for that. I had to go. Chapter 20, China. The Florida Everglades were beautiful, but not enough to keep my mind off Blaze. Through work and screening my calls from Cherry, I'd managed to cut him completely out of my life. I didn't see him, no one I saw knew him, and Cherry didn't mention him after the first couple of times that I hung up on her. I should have been okay. It had been almost two weeks. Long weeks with nothing to do but work and enjoy Southern Florida. I should have been having the time of my life, planting and working on making magic happen with my seedlings. 
I was a stone's throw away from the beach. I was within five minutes of a beautiful bar. I was surrounded by scientists and beautiful surfers. Yet all I could think about was Blaze. I didn't need help thinking of him, but when I saw a large crane take to the air, my mind thought of him. When I saw a couple walking down the street, I thought of him. When I got back to my hotel room at night and saw that the cleaning people had been there, I thought of him. It was crazy. The only thing I could compare to the pain I felt was what I'd felt when Cherry and I had lost our mother. It was offensive to think that losing a man could compare to losing my mother. But my heart didn't care. I'd done my best to keep Blaze at arm's length while we were together those couple weeks. But he'd crept in. I'd barely allowed us to talk. But it had happened, of course. The tiny conversations we'd had while stripping or getting dressed after had snuck into my brain. And I kept hearing his voice. He'd tell me I was beautiful or comment on how he could tell I'd had a good day because I'd been more excited. He'd been paying so much attention to me the whole time that I'd ended up feeling special and cared for. Knowing what he was feeling when he gazed down at me before we both orgasmed together. Knowing that he'd looked at me with so much love and care. It was my undoing in the silent hours I spent alone at night. When I should have slept, I stared at the popcorn ceiling of my room and listened to cars go by on the highway outside the hotel, thinking of Blaze and what he was doing. He was always around. He didn't think I knew that he flew above me when I insisted I find my own way home at night, but I did. I could feel him making sure I got home safe. He'd hang out for a few minutes while I got ready for bed, and then he'd go back to his place. He kept watch over me. He threatened my neighbor for me. It was sick to say that I didn't want him to be controlling and then find all those things charming, but I did. I knew he wasn't trying to control me when he did those things. He was just caring for me. I couldn't feel him since I left home. I'd been out at night. I'd walked the beach alone. I'd even been to a bar and had a man hit on me. But there was no sign of him. I hadn't felt his jealousy or hurt. Nothing. He'd let me leave. It was what I'd said that I wanted, but having it didn't feel good at all. Instead of staying in and feeling like bashing my head against a wall all the time, I'd been working overtime and treating the plants I was trying to grow like my own children. I hung around them and did all the things I normally did with my plants. I talked to them, I sang to them, I even read to them. I did it so much that I was pretty sure my coworkers were convinced that I was crazy. I was also sure that the plants even thought I was overbearing. They weren't doing as well as they should have been, even if someone with my reputation had been growing them. It was like they could feel my mood. No matter how many times I sang upbeat songs to them, they remained droopy and slowly died in the wet soil they were in. It was one of the worst jobs I'd ever done. I wasn't surprised when the team who'd brought me on lightly explained that they weren't in need of my services anymore. It was fine. I'd have other jobs. One failed experiment wouldn't tarnish the reputation I'd gotten. It made me feel even worse, though. I felt like a failure in every aspect of my life. I was stuck in that mindset and didn't want to go home to kill my own plants, so I stayed in my hotel for another few days. There was no point in going home. I knew that I'd just run back to Blaze, and I still hoped there was some way that time would erase him from me. I was really feeling sorry for myself when Cherry called. Your nephew is kicking the shit out of me. A little of the ice around my heart melted. How are you doing? I'm miserable. I'm so tired that all I want to do is sleep. Lately, I keep noticing the children at the library. 
not when they're good. I notice when there are temper tantrums being thrown and pages being torn out of books and sassy backtalk being hurled at parents. What if my kid is a terrible little hellion? What if my kid is the kid who screams in the library? <laughs> I don't think that you and Cesar could make a hellion baby. You're both too sweet and nice. I sat back against my headboard and laughed. <laughs> Although I can see it now. You chasing your own kid around that big place for a change. Don't jinx me. So you don't think it'd be funny? Cherry fake laughed. No, and you won't either when you're the one watching him all the time. Or her. I didn't correct you earlier, but I could have a niece. You're out of luck, sis. I think Cesar willed it into being, but our little egglet is a boy. I sat up, the dark feeling fading for a bit. What? You found out? Why didn't you say anything? Why didn't you let me know when the appointment was? I didn't go to an appointment. Dragons and their magical noses can tell. She hesitated. And I didn't say anything sooner because I didn't think you'd care. Cherry, of course I'd care. You say that, China, but you've been so angry lately. You snap at everyone, and I can tell you're sad. I can feel it. We're not dragons or mates, but we're twins, China. I can feel how sad you are. I didn't want to say anything. I looked up and met my reflection stare. Deep bags darkened my lower lids. I'd lost weight, and even my hair seemed dry, frizzy, and brittle. I looked like hell. More importantly, I felt like hell. No wonder everyone could tell. Tears filled my eyes as I thought of my sister keeping something so exciting from me because she thought I'd be too negative for it. I'm sorry, Cherry. Stop it. With her own voice watery, Cherry admonished me. Don't apologize to me. You didn't do anything too awful. You need to come home. I know you're working, but you're making a mistake. I think you know it. I wiped my eyes and cleared my throat. Um, actually, my job just finished up. I was going to head back home soon. Like tomorrow? Yeah, I think so. Good. I miss you. I stood up and pulled my suitcase out of the closet. I miss you too. I'll see you soon, okay? And we'll talk more then? She pushed on. About Blaze? I didn't want to promise anything. I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, maybe. I'll take that as a yes. Chapter 21, Blaze. I stuffed one of the burgers we'd made into my mouth and pulled off the apron Cesar let me borrow before tossing it on top of his counter. I missed China like crazy, but kept myself occupied most days, struggling through whatever ridiculous lessons Cesar or Cherry or Beast's new adopted kids threw at me. Cooking, cleaning, I was even learning to be bossed around. It wouldn't be so bad if it wasn't for the fact that I knew it may not help me win my mate over at all. When are you going to tell her that you're learning home economics? Home economics? You're learning to cook and clean. You can make at least three meals now when you finally learned how to use a washing machine. Keep talking to me like I'm a youngling and I'm gonna flame your hide. Someone's cranky and needs a nap. I snarled at him. Scaly wing. Yup, see you tomorrow. He let out a whistle when a middle heavy cherry walked into the kitchen. There's my beautiful mate. It smells so good in here, I couldn't stay out. I was just leaving. You should tell her what you're doing, Blaze. Cherry walked over to me and rested her head on my arm, which elicited a growl from Cesar. She just grinned at him and retracted her hand. She's stubborn, but I think it would help if she knew that you were doing all of this for her. It is too soon. 
I wish you'd tell her anyway, or let me tell her. You promised. Fine. She raised her palms in the air. My lips are sealed. Your lips are delicious. As Cesar planted a kiss on his mate, I left the happy couple in their happy home and took to the air. Stepping back from my newly finished wall, I took a long pull from a flask containing Armand's brew and nodded in satisfaction. I had done well. Of course I had done well. I'd built the whole house to begin with. Repairing things had never been my strong suit, though. I was more of a tear it down and start over kind of dragon. Things change, I guessed. Well, some things, anyway. I looked around and felt a consuming bitterness. The whole house was clean. Dinner was prepared and on the counter, cooling. I was taking care of myself. I was doing everything I'd waited a century for a mate to do. It wasn't hard. I didn't know why I'd thought it would be so much worse than what it was. I'd also learned that if I kept the house clean, it was easier to pick up. I liked the house neat. It looked better, and I didn't stumble through trash or piles of clothes. I'd even installed a washing machine and a dryer. It was all pointless. Why was I going through the work of becoming what I thought she wanted, when it would not change China's mind? She didn't want me now, and she never would. So why bother? I drank more of the brew and went outside to sit in my new lawn and patio chairs. They looked nice with a table I'd built to go along with them. A potted flower of some kind sat in the middle of the table, a gift from Cherry. You are lucky I am not an enemy. I glanced back at Remy and shrugged. You say lucky, I say unfortunate. I could use a good brawl. Oh, come, brother. He circled the table and sat naked in one of my chairs. I made a mental note to burn it later. It cannot be that bad. It is not. It is worse. Then go after her. Do something, anything, anything other than what you've been doing. I've been cooking and cleaning. What is wrong with that? I nodded to my repaired wall and repairing the damage that you did to my home. <laughs> I did not do that alone. He watched me drink from the flask and frowned. Why did you ever learn to perfect all those chores if you did not intend to use them to impress your mate? She is gone. I wish everyone would get that through their heads. That's not what I hear. I hear she is returning soon. Her job has been canceled. My chest ached deeply. It will not matter. For whatever reason, she rejects me. Then, make her want you. It is not that easy, apparently. If she does not feel the same way you feel, is she really your mate? I growled. She is my mate. He held up his hands. Okay, okay. She's your mate. Are you really just going to let her slip away? Were you not up here just a while ago, telling me not to hold her against her will and comparing me to our father? Never, N not really. You are nothing like our father was, Blaze. You are no more like him than I am. If either of us had any doubt before, all of this, this should clear it up. What do you mean? Remy grabbed the flask from me and turned it up. The reason I don't think mother was father's true mate, I saw them once. I sat up at the twinge of pain in my brother's voice. You saw them what? I saw them, in bed, accidentally. I did not understand what I'd walked in on when I was a youngling, of course, I didn't really understand the dynamics of what I'd seen until I was here for a while, and much older, and I could look back with a discerning eye. What he was doing, it wasn't something that she wanted. My stomach soured. What are you saying? He was just using her, taking what he wanted from her. She wasn't fighting him, not really, but it was clear she was uncomfortable and not pleased. I know that now. 
At the time, what I'd witnessed had felt wrong, but I assumed it was just because I'd accidentally walked in on something not meant for my eyes. Now I know better. If she had been his mate, I don't think he would have been able to force her like that. He would not have been able to do that to her. He sighed. She would have been willing. Think back. Did she ever seem to love him or want him? She always cringed away from him. Why would she have left her family and come to the castle for him then? Do you really think she was given a choice? I stood up and walked away. Looking out at the water, I watched as the protruding eyes of a gator slipped beneath the light green algae-covered surface. I always assumed they were mates. I never thought to question it. It took me a while, but I have seen lately how Beast and Cesar treat their mates, how they care for them. It is nothing like the way father treated mother. You've seen them too. Can you even imagine Cesar or Beast touching their mates with a heavy hand? They would never do to their mates the things that father did to mother. It's not just because their kingdoms were what others call progressive either, Blaze. Just because we did not understand what it was back then, or have a word for it, does not mean that it was not abuse. That is what we were taught. It is all we know. How can we ever be worthy mates? You are speaking with an unmated brother. I do not know shit about shit. I glanced back at him. Shit about shit? He grinned. It's a human expression that Sky taught me. It means I know nothing. I believe it is natural to adapt to please one's mate, though. Beast went from being, well, a barbarian, to caring for Sky like she is his most precious treasure. She bosses him around now, and he allows it. I had witnessed the change in Beast. We all had. Cesar had not changed as much, but he was far less barbaric and more diplomatic than Beast to begin with. Cherry, too. She bosses Cesar around. I've seen how he does what she asks. I suppose I thought it was just because his kingdom was weak. Apparently not. Our kingdom was known as a backward, oppressive place. If you ask the rest of the dragons, our kingdom was cruel, tyrannical, and fascist. He inhaled deeply and blew it out slowly. They are right. We were the ones in the wrong, brother. I rubbed my hand over my beard stubble and squeezed my eyes shut. Maybe she would have stayed if I'd been different. Do you think you're different now? I do not know if I am different. I cannot imagine ever raising a hand to China now, but I felt the same before, too. I would rather rip my own arm off. I would rather die than hurt a single hair on her head. And you learn to cook and clean for her. But none of that really matters. I looked up at the darkening sky. She does not want a mating with me. Maybe sex, but perhaps not even that, or she would not have left. She has probably found someone else. Remy laughed. <laughs> that hurt you to say, didn't it? I just groaned. Fight for her. If she is your true mate, there is no one else for either of you. And it is meant to work out. Fate made one female who is perfect for you, brother. One. Are you willing to let her go? What would you have me do, Remy? Tired of my bed? I wouldn't suggest it. But it's not too late to figure out something that will work. She'll be back. Figure it out, brother. I glared at my twin. If only it were that simple. Chapter 22, China. There was something majorly wrong with me. I'd flown home with the intention of getting into my car and driving straight over to see Cherry. Instead, I'd driven home and gone straight to my boat. I was still wearing the clothes I'd slept in and flown in. I needed a shower and a change, yet I was speeding to Blaze's castle. I needed to see him. 
I couldn't stay away any longer. I didn't even know what I was going to say. I didn't have anything to say. Nothing had changed yet. Lord help me, I had to see him. I noticed the improvements to Blaze's house as soon as I got close enough to see the exterior. Everything was neat and tidy. There were more chairs and a table set up outside. There was even a potted plant. A plant! I tied up my boat and walked up the dock. The damaged sections had been repaired, and those that had been under construction were now as good as new. The place looked beautiful without the holes in it. The closer I got, the slower I moved. It threw me off to see so many changes. My stomach roiled, and I couldn't help but think the worst. Since Blaze hadn't shown up by the time I got to the door, I knocked. Waiting for the door to open was excruciating. On one hand, I wanted to turn and run, but on the other, I had an overwhelming desire to see him. I needed to know that he was still there, and that everything was still as it had been when I'd left. Had he sold the place and moved? I'd only been gone for a few days. He couldn't have. When the door was opened by Blaze, I felt so relieved to see him that I threw myself against him. I wrapped my arms around his neck and hugged him tight. It took me a moment to realize that he was not hugging me back. I forced myself away from him, even though my body was screaming not to break physical contact and forced a smile. I thought you might have moved. Everything's... Seeing that I'd trailed off and was staring behind him, Blaze stepped aside and let me enter. The place was spotless. Not only was it spotless, but it also smelled nice. The piles of dishes and takeout containers and dirty laundry were gone. The boxes of new plates and new clothes were gone. The place smelled sweet and delicious, like cinnamon buns. My heart sank. What happened? I jerked around to face him and gestured to the beautiful interior of his home. Did you hire someone? He took a deep breath and blew it out before talking. Why have you come here? I stammered. I just, I'm back early, and I thought I'd come and see you. He nodded and crossed over to a chair. Things are different, China. I have changed. Hearing that statement, spoken so matter-of-factly, felt as though I'd been dealt a physical blow. It was what I had feared from the moment I first saw the new and improved exterior. You met someone else? Another mate? One who wants to clean up after you? He snorted. No. Then what? I wrung my hands together and bit my lip hard before meeting his sad gaze. What we had was okay, right? We can still do that. When he shook his head, I felt his pain wash over me. His, mine, I wasn't quite sure whose, maybe both. I want all or nothing, China. I cannot keep doing that. I cannot be with you for only a short time and then watch you leave. Well, I can't stay permanently, Blaze. It's not like that. My voice had gotten sharp and I tried to get it under control. I can't do that kind of relationship. You do not have to clean or cook if you do not want to. You do not even have to stay here at my castle. He held his hands out to me. I can compromise. I can meet you in the middle. But I cannot allow you to keep pushing me away or treating me as though I mean nothing to you as though I am nothing more than a means to scratch your itch when you are in need. I deserve more. Don't do this, Blaze. I sounded desperate, even to myself. What we've been doing, it's all I have to offer. No. He stood up. I want you more than anything in this world, or any other world, China. 
I crave you. Without you, I'm only half of who I was. I cannot continue with what you want, though. I cannot sleep with you and then not hold you. I cannot be denied having a simple conversation with you. I cannot keep my feelings for you hidden for fear of you running away. I want you more than I have ever wanted anything. But if you cannot be my mate, for real, I will have to either find a way to survive without you or, more likely, I will perish. Perish? My stomach turned and I felt like throwing up. Everything he was saying should have been music to my ears. It was, deep down, what I wanted to hear. That he hadn't found someone else and moved on. But I could not seem to get a handful on the panic. He was offering me forever. He was holding out a silver platter with a future on it. Family, kids, minivan, the whole nine yards. He was offering me everything. Yet... I was terrified. What if I kept giving more and more until he slowly controlled me? What if I gave him my all and he left me battered and destroyed like my mother? Please, Blaze. I gripped his shirt to feel some kind of stability and blinked back tears. Don't do this. Don't make me choose. If you are not willing to talk to me and love me back, I cannot do this. You must leave. It is too hard with you here. I opened my mouth to argue, but no sound came out. The light touch of Blaze's hand on my back was a light in the darkness, a sign to turn back and rush into it. My feet moved without my mind's okay. Toward the door we both went. Blaze stopped at the threshold, and my feet carried me out, past it. When I turned to try to say something, the door was already closing. Wait, Blaze. Wait a second. I need a second. Go home, China, he sighed. Or go see your sister. She misses you. The door shut, and I just stood there feeling my own pain consume me so entirely that I wasn't sure how I was still standing. I wanted to be angry at him. I wanted to lash out and kick at his door, demand he face me and fight. I could feel his pain too, though. He was crushed that I'd walked out. Because, if I was being honest, that's what it amounted to. I'd walked out. I'd had one foot out the door this whole time. He'd given me every chance to stay with him, to make a relationship work. I'd chosen not to. Eventually, I turned around and staggered through tear-filled eyes back to my boat. I got home somehow and hurried into my house, just to grab my car keys and head to Cherry's. I needed my sister. Chapter 23, China. China, you're back. Cherry threw open the door and was smiling until she saw me. You're crying. I walked into her arms, her protruding belly pressing against my stomach. Somewhere along the way over, I'd let the flood waters loose and I wasn't sure I'd ever stop. I'm a mess. Come inside, come on. Let's get you settled on the couch and then we'll figure out what's happening, okay? I let her lead me inside, but I was already spilling my guts. I'm miserable. I've been trying to fight this situation with Blaze, but I can't. I went to him, and he told me he wants all or nothing. But I can't give him all, because what if he turns into his father? What if I turn into our mother? And I can't give away who I am? He made me leave his house, and I feel like I'm dying inside. I spit it all out on a whale. 
and by the time I was finished, I was on the couch with my head in my sister's lap. She stroked my hair while I sobbed against her pregnant belly. Mid-sob, I stopped to pat it and say hello to my nephew. This is big. I can't even remember the last time I saw you cry. Even when we were children. You don't cry. Cherry pressed her hand to my head. Nope, no fever. A hiccup escaped before I sat up and wiped my face on my sleeve. There's something I never told you. I took a deep breath as I contemplated where to begin. I wasn't sure how Cherry was going to take what I wanted to say. Sis, not long after we turned 18, I, I went to look for our mother. I waited to see how she would react to that statement. Don't tell me you found. Her words trailed off, and her face became ashen. She's dead. She died when we were small children. But I learned a lot about her from people who knew her. Gauging Cherry's reaction, she was stunned but curious. I had decided at the time that I would wait for a good time to tell her, but then there just never seemed to be a good time. I know this is going to be bad, Cherry whispered. If it was good, you would have told me a long time ago. After our dad died, our mother was just in a string of bad relationships, one after another. Cherry, it sounded like she was a magnet for loser men and dysfunctional relationships. The state took us away from her because she was so beaten and broken by men that she wasn't able to stand on her own two feet and take charge of her own life. She was literally controlled by one man after another until she was destroyed. She couldn't even protect her own children. Cherry had tears in the corners of her eyes as she absently caressed her belly. Cherry swallowed hard. Well, it's not like it comes as a great shock. We knew we were removed from her home by the state. Ever since I found out, I think I've been terrified that I would somehow follow in her footsteps. Like how? You thought you'd abandon your kids because of a man? Well, are you serious? My sister's jaw dropped. China, you are nothing like that. There is zero chance of you abandoning your children because of Blaze. Zero. And there's no chance Blaze would ever do anything but try to build you up. He's a good guy. He just wants to protect and love you. And for fuck's sake, China, you deserve that. It feels good. What I have with Cesar feels amazing. I want you to have it too. We were silent for a few minutes. It made sense when she put it that way. Blaze may have some old-fashioned ideas about gender roles, but he never tried to tear me down no matter how I treated him or what I said to him. I don't know what to do now. He made me leave. He kicked me out. Did you tell him how you feel about him? I shook my head. I couldn't. I was terrified, Cherry. Cesar vouched for him, and he's known him for centuries. I've spent a lot of time with him lately, too. He's nice, China. A little rough, but his heart is definitely in the right place. He's good disguised nephews, and he built me a crib because he wanted to thank me for teaching him how to use the washing machine. She stopped and covered her mouth. Oopsie. Anyway, he's nice. You taught him how to use a washing machine? Oh, crap. I wasn't supposed to tell you. With this baby brain, I can't be trusted. He's been coming over here every day, ever since he got kicked out of his cooking class. Cooking class? Oopsie, there I go again. He enrolled in a class at the Lafouche Parish Community Center. Then he got expelled when he had a little mishap and almost burned the place to the ground. So Cesar taught him to cook. Sky's nephews, Nick and Casey, helped teach him how to clean. I've been showing him how to work the washer and dryer. Separate whites and colors and fold things so they don't wrinkle. 
And really, isn't it just like a man to need lessons on that? Pick up the clothes, put the clothes away. You'd think it was rocket science to these dragons. He cooks. Yeah, and he's pretty good. She took my hand. He learned all that for you. He wants to be a good mate for you. He calls you his queen. It's so cute. <laughs> he is not a loser. He's a keeper, China. My mind was racing. I felt like she'd just dropped a bomb on my already war-torn world. But I don't understand. He doesn't just want to be with you. He wants to please you. He learned how to do all of that stuff because he wants to be better for you. She shook her head. I don't know why he sent you away after all of that. Something must be wrong. I do. Because I wouldn't commit to him. I wanted it to stay no strings. I wanted to keep him as my booty call. Oh, China. I sat up and curled into myself in the corner of the couch. He said all or nothing. I just couldn't make myself say yes to all. So I let him think I wanted nothing. But you don't want nothing, do you? No. I feel like my insides are being ripped apart constantly, Cherry. I killed plants while I was in Florida. I got fired. Fired. Me. Uh, I can't eat right and I can't sleep. I dream of him when I do sleep and... And? And I could feel how much it hurt him every time I walked out the door. I felt it and I left anyway. So? Apologize. Make it up to him. He'll forgive you, China. You'll forgive yourself. I was terrified of being with Cesar. I'm sure you remember. And you had such great advice. Thank God I eventually took it, because look at us now. We have a baby coming soon. We're a family. It's time I gave you back your own advice. You were right. It doesn't matter how broken we are. We can have happy endings. She stood up suddenly and planted her hands on her hips. You've been miserable for weeks, and I'm not going to sit here and watch you suffer because you're chicken shit. Go out and get your happily ever after. I gaped at her. Yeah, I'm getting my mom voice ready, so you better listen. You can sit here on my couch and cry until we all float away, or you can go back to Blaze's and tell him how you really feel. You can have amazing makeup sex, and you can start your life with him. You get a man who can cook and clean, and more importantly, a man who's willing to work on himself for you because he loves you. It all starts with telling him the truth. I shook my head. He doesn't love me. He barely knows me. She rolled her eyes. You don't love him? I, I stopped myself from giving the automatic answer and unfolded myself from the couch. Oh, God. Say it. Say that you love him. I know you do because I know you. You wouldn't act this way if you didn't. You've probably loved him since the first time you saw him. This whole mate thing is a real doozy. I, I, I swallowed. I have to go. She smiled. Damn right. Go get your dragon. With tears still streaming down my face, I opened the door to find a heavy rain shower had started outside. China, before you go, I just have one question. Mom was an exotic dancer, wasn't she? I mean, that explains our names, right? Leave it to my sister to make me laugh. <laughs> Actually, there's no explanation for her giving us stripper names. None that I could find. Chapter 24, Blaze. I'm sorry. The pouring rain battered the slick dock and ran in rivulets down her face. 
I'd open the door, expecting to cave to whatever China wanted. I'd made my demands, but if she came back telling me that she still only wanted sex, I was going to agree to anything. I could not turn her away a second time. What I hadn't expected was to find her standing at my doorstep, soaked to the bone, screaming at me over the storm. I'm sorry that I hurt you. I'm sorry that I treated you the way I did. I was scared. I was scared of you hurting me, so I hurt you first. I was afraid of being the woman my mother was, so controlled, so damaged by a man that she abandoned her children and never looked back. I'm sorry, Blaze. Her voice was getting eaten up by thunder, but I could make out the words she was saying. I'm so sorry for what I've done to you. Shocked, I just stood there. It was wrong. She jumped when a flash of lightning struck too close to us and then looked back at me with fear in her eyes. I can finish talking out here if you don't want me to come in. I jerked into action and grabbed her shoulders to bring her inside. Slamming the door shut, I grabbed a towel from the load of clothes I'd been folding and wrapped it around her. She was shivering so much that her teeth were chattering. Thank you. She looked up at me with tears in her eyes. I can't say that I'm sorry enough. I messed up. I was awful. I don't expect you to forgive me. But I have to tell you that none of it was because I don't want you. China, I... No, let me explain, please. She waited until I nodded to keep talking. Cherry and I never knew the man who impregnated my mother. He left before we were born. My mom died. We were dropped off one day in this horrible orphanage run by this horrible woman who would tell us that no one wanted us. She was right to an extent. We were shuffled off to many foster homes, and even then they only tolerated us. When you showed up, I got scared. I have all these issues, Blaze. I was broken into a million pieces before I was even in kindergarten. And that's what I am, broken. I blinked at her a few times and had to clear my throat to get my voice back. I didn't know where to start. I was angry at all the people who had hurt her along the way and made her so scared to open her heart to me. But mostly, I felt shock and relief. Maybe I want the job of putting the pieces together. I clasped her shoulders and stared down at her, trying to read her feelings. Sure enough, I could sense her slowly opening to me. A tinge of sorrow, hope, even anger at herself. More than anything, I could feel her love for me. It burned hotter than anything I'd ever felt. And I wanted more. You love me. She blushed and looked away. When I thought she'd deny it, she met my gaze and nodded. And you love me. I nodded. Since the moment I laid eyes on you. But I wasn't good to you. I moved my hand up to grasp the back of her neck. I wasn't good either. I was an idiot. I didn't think that I needed to change, and I was wrong. I'm sorry that I expected you to be a maid. Don't apologize. What I did was so much worse. I squeezed her neck tightly and pulled her into my chest. I can feel you now. I've never felt anything like it. I'm so sorry. Stop apologizing, mate. If you want me to feel better, you must feel better because I can feel what you feel now. And we can put the past behind us. I hesitated. Right? You're here to stay? She pulled back enough to look up at me. I have my own house. Then we'll stay there if you want. With a light laugh, she nodded. It's nothing like this castle, but wherever we stay, we're together now. I let out a whoop of excitement, startling her. And right after that, a loud peal of thunder rang out, rattling the windows. 
Maybe we should stay here tonight. China looked up at me with more of that hope in her eyes. I think we should stay here for a few nights. We have a lot of catching up to do. We should talk at some point. We could cook for each other. You want to cook for me? The sadness in her eyes finally gave way to joy, and she smiled. Well, to be honest, I don't know how to cook, but I can order takeout. I could not stop smiling if I tried. Later, I believe you came here earlier looking for something. She buried her face against my chest. Ugh, I'm sorry. I lifted her into my arms and carried her to my bedroom. No more being sorry. It's time to focus on our future. The good stuff. You didn't forget how to be bossy while I was away, I see. I laughed before dropping her onto the bed. There are just some places where I am in charge, mate. I watched her nipples pebble through her wet shirt. I ate it all up and greedily wanted more. Why do you get to be the boss? She teased me as she moved up the bed away from me. I accepted the dare in her voice, and yanking my shirt over my head, I fully planned to rise to the challenge. Chapter 25, China. Everything was different. There were no walls anymore. Not only could I feel his thoughts and emotions, but our depth of connection was also unparalleled. It was like strings had attached themselves to us, tethering us together. I could almost see them. What is that? I got up on my knees and licked my lips. I was eager for him, but I was also floored by our connection. What's happening? Do you feel that? Blaze grinned. Yes, it is the mate bond completing. You are stuck with me now, my queen. When he grabbed me around my waist and pulled me against him, I let him, surprising myself by how willing I was to surrender to his authority in the bedroom, at least for that moment. He sucked my bottom lip into his mouth, and I wrapped around him, making sure to leave the connection open so he could feel everything I was feeling. I wanted him to know the pleasure he gave me. He lifted me so my legs locked around his waist and then lowered me to the bed, his lips never leaving mine. Softly, he made love to my mouth. His hands stroked my hips and legs, never failing to stimulate some part of me while his hips gently rocked against mine. As the friction built, my fingers dug into his shoulders, and I rocked faster against him. I was already so close, so ready to explode. He hadn't even undressed me, and I was falling over the edge. After one more thrust of his hips, I came, with my fingers twisting into his hair and a breathy cry he caught in his mouth. I trembled as Blaze peppered kisses down my neck and shoulder, teasing my sensitive skin until my breathing normalized. You were made for me in every way, China. His hoarse whisper in my ear sent a fresh wave of tingles through me. My sister was right. This connection was amazing. As he held me tight, I could feel his heart pounding in his chest, and like magic, sinking perfectly in rhythm with mine. I pressed my hand over his chest and smiled up at him. I don't think I'll ever get tired of this. Blaze smiled. I certainly hope not. Whose turn will it be to make dinner tonight? Sorry about my cooking skills, but I order a mean pizza. I grinned. Why do I need pizza when I have you? I sat up and stared down at him as he rolled over and reclined against the pillows. Blaze, my mood grew slightly more serious, and I kept my eyes on his. Do you think everything will work out for us? I know it will, my queen. We are mates. And now that we can connect to one another, 
It will help us learn what makes each of us happiest. Right then, I was pretty sure that as long as I had him, I would be the happiest I'd ever been. It was sappy and scary to feel dependent on someone that way, but I wouldn't lie to him or myself again. I don't mind doing the floors. Blaze cocked his brow. I figure we can split the household chores. I didn't want to be saddled with them all, but you shouldn't have to do them all either. I thought we could figure that out eventually. No, I'm claiming floor mopping now, especially since I can buy a robot vacuum and mop to do it for me. Blaze frowned and shook his head. Robot? I don't like them. What's the matter, old man? Can't keep up with the changing times? He laughed and flipped me under him. Looking down at me with a big smile on his face, his eyes glowing amber, he looked rugged and wild. I have two rules. I'm the boss in the bedroom and no robots. Biting my lip, I pretended to think it over. I'll give you the bedroom, but is it a hard no on the robots? With a roll of his hips, Blaze answered another hard question. I have a feeling we will come to a compromise. I suspect we will become quite good at that. I like compromise. I leaned up and nipped at his jaw. My king. Who knew that a dragon shifter who had hundreds of years of practice being stern and inflexible would be so phenomenal at compromising? The End This has been Fire Breathing Blaze, Dragons of the Bayou, Book Three. Written by Candace Ayers. Narrated by Tina Scott. Copyright 2019 by Lovestruck Romance. Production copyright by Lovestruck Romance.